institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. We're supposed to, her. We're supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. This, my friends, is Talk Today with me, Jeremy Kyle. And me, Nicola Thorpe. This is Talk Today with David Ball and Nicola Thorpe. Good morning. It's six o'clock on Monday, the 8th of April. Yo, we talk today on TV, radio, online, and of course on your smart speaker. Our top stories this morning. Troops are withdrawn from southern Gaza, raising fears where they might target next. As Lord Cameron sends a clear message to the Israeli Prime Minister. Angela Rayner's tax row deepens. Labour's deputy leader faces allegations she registered the wrong property as her main home. And is the royal rift about to be healed? Claims that Prince Harry and William are planning an awkward meetup. We'll have the latest this hour. And no changes in the conditions. Once again, it's looking rather unsettled for today. In fact, for the whole week, wet and windy conditions for many. I'll have the details in the forecast a little later. Super, thank you very much indeed. But now it's time for the headlines with Emily. Thank you, David. Good morning. The Israeli military says it's reducing its number of troops in southern Gaza, but it's not thought to be a sign the war may be coming to an end. It's feared Israel could now be returning its focus onto Rafah, where hundreds of thousands of civilians are sheltering. Yesterday, British Foreign Secretary Lord Cameron said UK support for Israel isn't conditional after an Israeli attack on an aid convoy last week that left seven people dead. The UN's atomic watchdog has warned a new drone attack on Ukraine's Zaporizhia power plant raises the risk of a major nuclear accident. Russia's Nuclear Power Corporation has accused Ukraine's military of carrying out the strikes, but Kyiv denies involvement. Three people were injured. The plant's Russian-installed administration said radiation levels were normal and that there was no serious damage. Here and a major manhunt continues after a young mum was stabbed and killed while pushing her baby in a pram in Bradford. The 27-year-old was stabbed a number of times on Saturday afternoon and died later in hospital. Well, police say Habiba Masum is wanted over the attack. They say he was known to the victim but won't confirm how. Police also say he shouldn't be approached. Major disruptions expected across the rail network this morning as train drivers walk off the job in their third day of major strike action. It's part of the ASLEF union's long-running dispute over pay and working conditions. Staff at 16 train companies are taking part, causing cancellations, delays or no service at all in some areas. And stargazers here will get to enjoy part of North America's total solar eclipse tonight. If you live in the western parts of the UK, look up just before sunset. You could see a partial eclipse, which is where the moon is covering a small portion of the sun. Those are headlines. I'll have another update in an hour's time. We'll be discussing that more when we speak to Naz about the weather later on. <laughs> we will certainly you be will. Staying awake for the uh, eclipse? Uh, I don't think no, so. No, not, not no I like them though, yeah. and uh, saw a lot when I was growing up. But uh, I don't think I'll stay up now. <laughs> okay. You, when we when do you ever get sleep? Well, there, well there, there is that as well. Yeah, it's quite right. <laughs> right thank you so much, Emily. Well, on to our top story today. Israel's defence minister says that troops have been withdrawn from southern Gaza, raising fears that their next target could be Rafa. Now the news comes as the foreign secretary Lord Cameron says Britain's support for Israel is not unconditional following the killing of seven aid workers. Well, joining us now is Chris Parry, former NATO commander and editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post, Zvika Klein. Zvika, good morning. What's your reaction to the withdrawal of troops from Khan Yunus and what do you think this means next? There's definitely kind of a, a, a broad... Uh, support amongst Israeli society um, for this type of a move. Um, uh, though many Israelis do not, you know, support Prime Minister Netanyahu or his government, um, the belief in I the IDF uh, is stronger than what it, you know, what it was at the beginning of this of this war. Um, and the Israeli leadership has also made it clear that they will not 
end this war before um, they're actually able to obtain uh, um, all of these Israeli hostages. So until that doesn't happen, um, we're not expected to see any sort of of uh, stopping. Even though I will I will, will say for the past few weeks, um, the operation hasn't been actually very active. It's been a very kind of sterile, you know, specific operations here and there, uh, but not like an actual uh, uh, combat situation. Uh, Chris, let's bring you in here. This has actually been a very fast-moving situation across the weekend. As we've heard there, the IDF says troops have been withdrawn from southern Gaza, leaving just one brigade in there. They go on to say, actually, they're regrouping before they make their next move. We also know ceasefire talks are taking place. But the two sides t seem to be really at intractable positions. So you've got Netanyahu saying Israel is ready to reach a hostage deal. Uh, but there are uh, conditions... That attached to that. They will not agree to a ceasefire until the hostages are released. And, of course, Hamas is saying something quite different. They're saying that, actually, we need to release the Palestinian prisoners before they will even counter any kind of settlement. What's your reading of the situation? Well, uh, from the military point of view, um, it's quite simple. You've had uh, quite a lot of Israeli troops involved for about six months now. Um, the people themselves need uh, to have some R&R, &R. Uh, the vehicles, the equipment need some maintenance. So you can't sustain this sort of pressure uh, for much longer. Um, so there's a, a genuine sort of desire to recycle uh, and get back into the fray again. I also detect that uh, we're changing from what I call uh, urban operations to what we would familiarly call counterinsurgency, more targeted operations against Hamas. Uh, and the other fighters. I think we have to remember that Israel has been very successful in taking out quite a lot of Hamas fighters so far. They've destroyed most of the tunnels in the northern two-thirds uh, of Gaza uh, and now have to go uh, much more carefully into the south because there's so much of the Gazan population there. So I think some of the international pressure has told. There has been a change in military tactics. Uh, and as I said, there's uh, some R&R &R required for the Israeli forces, most of whom, of course, are reservists. So they have real jobs in, in the real economy. On the uh, broader front, um, it seems to me that uh, the focus has to come back onto the hostages and the eradication of Hamas. Uh, there's too much focus in the international community right now on what's happening to the Gazan population. Uh, I think people are getting impatient and intolerant. Um, I think we saw there was a demonstration uh, in Israel, about 100,000 people saying, look, you know, we're not concentrating enough on the hostages. Uh, the problem is, uh, it's rather like uh, in a divorce. You can't actually force somebody unless you go to court uh, to, to actually cooperate. And Hamas isn't cooperating. Um, I, I'd like to see some proof myself that the hostages are still alive. Um, because, well, uh, well, I mean, I think I'm that's a, 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 Hamas's motives in this. It's a great point. 129 hostages still held. We believe 34 of those are presumed dead. But you said about the eradication of Hamas there, Chris. Is that actually possible that Israel can do that? They say they will do that. Many people are saying all this is doing is radicalising more people in Gaza, 1.8 million people displaced uh, in southern Gaza. Well, whenever people say to me, you can't eradicate an ideology, I always say, well, we did it in World War II in Germany and in Japan. Uh, you just have to hold your nerve and you have to uh, step on the gas. I mean, after all, we displaced and bombed a lot of people in World War II uh, and the next generation was peaceful. Uh, the fact of life is you've got to have the will to live in peace with your neighbours. If you haven't got that, Israel will be perpetually under siege and Israelis will be in an open prison themselves. Well, Prime Minister Netanyahu spoke at a press conference overnight where he criticised uh, the criticism that Israel has been receiving from the West. Uh, I believe we've got a little clip of that now. Let's take a look. I made it clear to the international community there will be no ceasefire without the return of the hostages. It just won't happen. Israel is ready for a deal. Israel is not ready to surrender. Instead of international pressure being directed at Israel, which only causes Hamas to harden its positions, the pressure of the international community should be directed at Hamas. Can I get your response to that clip there? I mean, I, I, on the one hand, I agree with the Prime Minister. I think um, 
you know, if you if we have um, relationships with with Western countries that see us as a Western country, there should be this, you know, you know, support um, to any type of, of major decision uh, when it comes to lives of civilians. Um, that said, you know, Israel also cannot ignore the fact that all these international countries, Western countries, have to also deal with their internal issues and criticisms um, of the situation. So, I mean, on the one hand, you have to be aware of what's going on internationally, but I think it is is expected that, you know, allies do support, you know, when fighting against a terrorist organization, mm. there shouldn't be a question at all. I mean, there, it's there the same be, enemy. But, Speaker, there has to be a question, surely, over breaking international law, and that's the, the criticism that was pointed towards Netanyahu's government last week? Well, uh, international law hasn't really been very um, objective when it comes to Israel. You know, international law wasn't very active uh, when hundreds of thousands of people were being killed in Syria, et cetera. Um, so that's not exactly, you know, it's not like a rocket science where there's actual, you know, uh, evidence and actual uh, um implementation of this international law. At the end of the day, um, you know, killing, killing of, of, of peace workers who are bringing food is something that everybody regrets and definitely was not on purpose. Um, that said, this is a war zone, and in war zones, people get killed. Um, Speaker, can I just obviously, ask the IDF so, should have been more careful. So, VK, can I just ask you about the change in tone from the West? Rishi Sunak says the United Kingdom remains appalled. He's gone further. He says he wants an immediate humanitarian ceasefire. He actually wants to go to a long-term, sustainable ceasefire. Also, the front page of one of the newspapers here this morning, it talks about uh, David Cameron and his response, saying that actually the UK support for Israel is not unconditional. This is very much a change in tone from the United Kingdom. I, I saw that, you know, I saw that headline from uh, from Lord Cameron. And I, I have to say, as an Israeli uh, citizen, as an, and a, an Israeli uh, journalist, I was, uh, I was appalled. And I think um, that is something that allies do not do not do. And you know, I'm not. We're not talking about fringe politicians in in parties that just want to be, you know, seeking for attention. This is a serious politician uh, with a serious role, and and making that type of a statement is something that harms Israel, um, not only uh, long term but also short term. Speaker, just um, really quickly, is it not good that we hold conditions on our allies? And as a good ally, one would hope that we do, we do adhere to for example, international law, and that there are those lines that we both agree each other would not cross. It's a good thing, surely. We all have our red lines, 100%. I think if, if the only issue is, 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 is accidentally in, in a terrible situation, killing you know, uh, volunteers from around the world, bringing food in a, in a war zone, in a mistaken situation, that is not a reason to cause a ceasefire. And again, we're talking about a terrorist organization. We're not talking about a country. And we still have, you know, more than 100 uh, Israelis, most of them civilian, many of them civilians, who are, we haven't even seen evidence to um, their, their, their actual living. So that's a difficult situation. Well, thank you to former NATO commander Chris Parry and Zvika Klein from the Jerusalem Post there. Let's take a look at some of this morning's front pages now. The Telegraph focuses on Lord Cameron's warning to the US over blocking aid to Ukraine, claiming they're risking the security of the West. The Times leads on the rise of the 24-hour wait for a bed in A&E as more than 150,000 patients waited more than one day for a hospital bed last year. And the Mail say, Rainer's making a fool of you, Keir, as the Labour leader faces criticism for his unwillingness to probe claims against his deputy's property dealings. Well, let's stick with that story now, the story about Angela Rayner, because Labour's deputy leader's tax affairs were in the spotlight for most of the weekend, following those claims about 
a second home. Well, Shadow Foreign Secretary David Lammy has now jumped to Rayner's defence, claiming it's all a smear that's designed to distract from the Tory chaos. Well, joining us now, our Times Radio presenter James Hansen and former Labour adviser Mike Buckley. James, let, let's start with you. This is the story that keeps giving. I was talking about it all weekend, actually, mm. and it seems to unravel. You and I were talking earlier as well. So, so the crux of this is basically Angela Rayner had a primary home, she says, mm -hmm. which was in Vicarage Road. Yeah. She claimed that she, that was her primary residence, even though she was married, she had children, and she seems to be cohabiting in Lounders Lane with her husband. Now, the whole, all of this is based around the fact she sold that primary residence that she says she made profit and she didn't pay capital gains. And that's the story, and she's sticking to it. Yes, because had it been actually a second home, then you'd be liable to pay capital gains tax. Now, in the grand scheme of things, not very much, you know, compared to what some other politicians have, have had to do in disputes with HMRC over their tax. We're talking about £1,500 here. But still, you know, she may have, and we don't know, but she may have been liable for capital gains tax because what we haven't had is clarity on where her primary residence was. Now, I can understand why anyone, Angela Rayner or any of us, might get into a pickle over this because capital gains tax law is quite complicated. It's quite hard to know exactly. And, and people do have complicated living arrangements, as Angela Rayner has kind of admitted herself. But there are questions here that remain unanswered. And until the Labour Party provide more clarity, I think for them, this is an awkward story and it's not going away. Mike, do you think this is as influential a gotcha moment as some politicians on the right or in the Tory party think that it is? No, I don't think it is at all. I mean, as David Lammy said yesterday, there are lots of people across the country who live in blended families, who have different, different living arrangements. Some people living in one property, other people living in another property. Angela had, a, I think, at least one previous child at this point from, from another marriage or another relationship. Mm. And then she'd, she'd recently married um, uh, the person who she was with at this time, back in 2014. So I think people realise there are lots of people, people out there with different living arrangements. I don't think it is a gotcha moment at all. Angela's made clear that this was her primary residence. She sold it perfectly legally. She was given tax advice. She didn't own any capital gains tax. I'm sure she submitted all the information to the HMRC so, at well, the time. So there's more, there's there more isn't to the this case story. to answer. There's more to this story, though, because obviously when she went back to her husband's home, she then tweeted, and this is what the mail story is all about, she tweeted, I'm back at home. Also, when you look at the furniture, the soft furnishing, and this is, the, this is what the mail has uncovered, they're in the other house. Now, that would lend a weight to the idea that actually where she says her primary residence was may not have been. And there are issues over whether she claimed a single-person dis discount as well. I mean, if she was trying to hide something, do you not think she would have gone back on her Twitter feed and deleted these posts? She's clearly sitting there thinking, I have nothing to hide, this is fine. I think lots of people, again, have periods in their lives yeah. they call different places home. I do it at the moment. So, I, you know, I would say, if I'm going to visit my parents, oh, I'm going home for the weekend. They live in Blackpool, you know. It, it, or you'd say, I'm going home to the home where I live mm. with yeah. my partner. It, these things change but, and, but and if, language changes around If she's done nothing wrong, why not publish <laughs> this independent tax advice that she has had? You know, I agree, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Be transparent. You say, Mike, that she's been transparent. Not really. Why hasn't she published this advice? And they could make this story go away. I don't think this is, you know, some terrible misdeed she's done here. You're absolutely right. People live in complicated living yeah. arrangements, blended families, whatever. So just be open about it. But also, what does it say? This, this woman could be Deputy Prime Minister. If she has done, if she has broken the law, it's untenable for her to be Deputy Prime Minister. And that's but what our many current people, Prime Minister broke what, the law. But to go into office having he, having he broken the law, the law whilst in office. but it doesn't mean it just because someone did it doesn't mean it's right that everyone does it. And there has to be there has to be it's accountability and scrutiny. I don't, I don't even life. know. If, I don't even know if this counts as breaking the law. I mean, even if she did not pay the capital gains tax, if she, she claimed she incorrectly done. a single person discount, if she also fraudulently said that house was her primary residence, which it wasn't, that it's is breaking criminal, the law. Though. If I, that is a criminal offence, and it's breaking the law. I don't think anybody. I don't know if anybody suggested that she broke the law, but. I mean, I think the most of the people are suggesting that she might owe a small amount of capital gains tax. She claims that she didn't. I know this is now being investigated. This is now being investigated by the police. We will all find out. She will find out. My understanding is that she believes 
that she's done exactly the right thing. And I, I haven't actually, having read all the information about this, I haven't seen any, any information that persuades me otherwise. So James. why doesn't she do what James says? Publish it? Well, her argument is, why should I publish my tax affairs when loads of Conservative sitting ministers haven't published their tax affairs, which is perfectly But reasonable. she has previously demanded other Conservative ministers publish their tax affairs, which leaves her open to this yeah. charge of hypocrisy. And politically, Labour has to be very careful about that. I, I would agree. Also, there is... Sorry, Nicola, there is... <laughs> I'm on a roll. Well, uh, there is one other part <clears throat> to this, which is, of course, she brought it under the Right to Buy scheme, which, of course, was the Thatcher principle. And she has also been in public saying she doesn't agree with the Right to Buy. That, that smacks of hypocrisy, I think, to many people around the country. I think, I mean, she bought a home in a way that... In, because she was able to buy a home under a policy... So it's fine was, for her, but not fine illegal. for everyone else. Well, Labour's policy on this is not to get rid of right to buy. What Labour wants to do is re make sure that housing that is sold under right to buy is replaced. Because the great scandal of right to buy is we've sold so many council properties over the last 30-odd years, 40-odd years, they haven't been replaced, which is why we've got waiting lists that are thousands and thousands long. That is the big issue here, not somebody's paid or not paying their council tax. Mike, how much do you think misogyny and classism plays into this story? Oh, I think incredibly. I mean, I think this is all you about her being kidding. a working class Seriously? woman. Seriously? Yes, of course. I mean, it's all over it. It's the misogyny, it is the classism, it's the fact that she's got a regional accent. It is all of those things. It's let's take a pot shot at J her. James, would you agree? No. I don't agree. <laughs> like, I think I. it is legitimate. You know, as whatever, the only woman here, I do think... Whatever background you come from... As the only northern here, I think so. It is fair enough. <laughs> if you have demanded tax transparency from other politicians, you have to hold yourself to the same standards. Yep, yeah, and I, I totally agree with this, with that. But when we compare the uh, spotlight that's been shown on Angela Rayner, considering how much money she would potentially owe as a result... It's nothing to do with the amount of money. It's the principle. If you are Deputy Prime Minister, you do not break the law. Yes, but she wasn't an MP at the time. That's irrelevant. Okay. It's utterly irrelevant. Just in terms of, and now we're not meant to argue between <laughs> ourselves. Just in terms, just in terms of where, we can, we just can in argue. terms of where we go from here, though. Mm. As you said right at the beginning, this story isn't going away anytime soon. And they couldn't make it go away. This exactly. is what I don't understand. So, so, so what happens next? Because obviously the Mail, and this was the Mail on Sunday, has got all of this evidence, yeah. and there is a criminal investigation. What does Starmer do here? He is supporting Angela Rayner. We've also got other characters like David Lammy supporting Angela Rayner. People at home are thinking not more political sleeves. Well, it's very interesting if you look at the language that Keir Starmer and David Lammy and others have been using. They say things like, Angela Rayner has been very clear, which implies that if it subsequently comes out that Angela Rayner was liable to pay capital gains tax or is in the wrong somehow, they can kind of throw her under the bus because they can imply that they have been misled by her. So the language here is quite clever. Now, I'm not saying it'll come to that, but it's interesting. And whether we see Keir Starmer, you know, ask for a bit more clarity because he wants to talk about other stuff. Labour are frustrated every time we're having this conversation about Angela Rayner's tax affairs, which, again, is why I think it's bizarre that they don't publish this advice and make the story go away. Well, thank you so much, James Hansen <laughs> from Times Radio and former Labour advisor Mike Buckley. It got quite spicy there for 20 past six well, in the morning. Indeed, well, indeed, indeed. A, a very good start. <laughs> still to come on Talk Today. We'll be discussing Britain's care home shame as residents cope with inadequate facilities. And Russ Cook, otherwise known as the hardest geezer, completes his race around Africa. What an amazing man. Well, Ava Santina from Politics Joe and the spectators Freddie Gray take us through this morning's papers. That's next. Do stay with us. The time, six. 22. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position. But I think he'd need to say that he got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. 
May. Might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media, having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square because you've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to you Talk today. It is 6.25. We'll have the weather in just a moment. But here's what else is coming up in the programme. Well, manners don't matter. Gen Z are shunning traditional table manners, saying they don't care about elbows on the table or using a phone whilst eating. More on that in the papers next. Stabbing tragedy. A manhunt continues after a mother pushing her baby in a pram was killed on Saturday night. We'll get the latest at 6.40. And Amy's back. The Amy Winehouse biopic, Back to Black, premieres tonight. The Sun on Sunday's showbiz editor, Hannah Hope, joins us with more details. That's at 7.45. But first, let's take a look at the weather with Naz. Naz, welcome back. Not just the weather I want to talk to you about, but this mm. eclipse. What can you tell us? Yeah, um, so we might be seeing the partial... Well, we're not going to... Might be. We are going to see a partial <laughs> eclipse, but not everywhere is going to see it. Ah. Ah. I think it's going to be a bit too cloudy. I think it happens around uh, five minutes to eight this evening, and probably the best place to see it's the far north of Scotland, where the skies will be clear for a time at, at that time. Mm. So around Sutherland, Caithness, and Shetland and Orkney. Oh, so nice. basically... Not here. Yeah, not here. <laughs> <laughs> not here, and it's not your total eclipse yeah. either. I think the US is the best place for all of that. Uh, but let's just take a look at the weather. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning. It was a rather unsettled weekend, wet and windy as well, thanks to Kathleen. But it was also a warm weekend. We saw temperatures top 20 degrees Celsius for the first time this year. So uh, is it going to remain warm? Well, it's going to be more like average temperatures over the next few days before it turns warmer into the weekend. But it's also going to stay unsettled. Lots of low pressure systems bringing through wet and windy conditions over the next couple of days. And then as we head into the weekend, high pressure starts to build from the south. So as a result, southern areas will see more more settled weather but not so for this morning it's a cloudy and wet one across much of wales down towards the southwest there will be rain soon and across northern england whereas across scotland and northern ireland it's fine and bright but it's a chilly start there and mainly dry but fairly cloudy across eastern parts of england now through this afternoon that rain will be steadily moving its way northwards it's actually a named storm by meteo france and it will be heading up towards parts of scotland but for most of the day scotland looks fine and bright northern ireland will see that rain this afternoon though and wales and the southwest
northwest will also be rather cloudy with outbreaks of rain. In fact, some hefty showers will be moving northwards across parts of the Midlands, central, southern, and possibly some eastern parts of England through this afternoon that could cause some localised flooding issues. Even into tonight, those sundry downpours will be moving further northwards. And in fact, there will be uh, rather strong winds developing as well as that name storm from uh, Meteo France starts to approach. We'll see that rain continue its journey further northwards as well, up towards parts of Scotland. As I mentioned, if you want to see the partial solar eclipse, the far north of Scotland may see clear spells for a time. So that's the best spot, really. Otherwise, it's looking rather cloudy for many areas tonight and a little bit cooler compared to previous ones, as well as wet and windy through tomorrow. Wet and windy weather continues to move through and northeastwards. As you can see, some showers out towards western parts of Scotland, more persistent rain across Shetland, Orkney and towards Aberdeenshire. And across uh, Northern Ireland, there will be a few showers, but lots of sunshine, sunshine and showers for the southwest of England, as well as across much of Wales. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Thank you very much indeed, Now It's now time to go through today's papers with Ava Santina from Politics Joe and The Spectator's Freddie Gray. Good morning, Good morning. to the two morning. of you. Really nice to see both of you. Freddie, let's start with the Daily Telegraph, if we can. Cameron warns the US over Kyiv aid block. It's complicated, but the UK has pledged money. The European Union has pledged money. The United States, I think, back in, what, February, pledged money. It's been held up. It's been held up, and uh, Lord Cameron uh, made a bit of a mistake last time. I think he went a little bit over his skis with the Americans right. and said, you know, you're in danger of being like Chamberlain was uh, with Hitler, appeasement and mm -hmm. so on, which, of course, the Americans were said, well, hang on a second, Chamberlain was a Brit, <laughs> so don't, <laughs> yeah. don't lecture us about that. Uh, he's going to do it again this week. We're going to pressure the Americans to spend more money. I think what's striking here is that we have uh, a foreign policy that's name is David Cameron. I mean, he's freestyling foreign policy at the moment. You, yesterday, he was writing about Israel. It's a, it's a sign of how dysfunctional this government is, that David Cameron is just sort of running his own PR campaign mm. around our foreign policy. And he doesn't get to answer questions in the chamber, Ava, because he's a Lord, not an MP. Yeah, this was reviewed by a select committee. I think it's going to be reviewed again in a couple of weeks' time when Parliament returns. But, yeah, obviously he can't be held to account there. He is, a, he is asked questions in the Lords, mm. yeah. but I don't know if you've ever watched the Lords. <laughs> Um, a lot of them are asleep. Riveting. Yes, yeah. <laughs> a lot of them are asleep. So it's not it's not quite the uh, you know the the proper the introspection grilling. that you'd want. Yeah. No, it's not quite the cut and thrust of, mm. of the other chamber, is it? But but that's very interesting what you say, Freddie, about a dysfunctional government. We were talking over the weekend about the fact that Rishi Sunak seems to be totally out of control of what's going on. We talked about him being hangry angry and hungry the whole time. Yeah, he's and obviously, all, all of these ministerial <laughs> positions are basically, as you say, freewheeling and doing whatever they want. And, they, and there is no sense of strategic direction from the government at a time when actually what they desperately need is strategic direction. And particularly on foreign policy, I'd say, because, I mean, that's why David Cameron has been able to just grow in stature in the last few months, because Rishi Sunak's far too distracted with the economy, I mean, understandably, for many reasons, but he's not really, he doesn't really have a foreign policy vision. He never really has. And this is a time when the world does, we are in quite dangerous times. You know, there's two, two rather big wars going on, uh, multipolarity. The world is slightly in danger of, of breaking out into World War Three, And we have uh, David Cameron. I mean, in some ways, it's good. I mean, he's, he's more competent in terms of uh, sort of media relations than a lot of his predecessors. Um, but in other ways, I think nobody quite knows what Britain's doing on the world stage, mm -hmm. and I think that's a concern. Mm -hmm. Another element of this story, of course, is this is a statement he's making with Stéphane Sejourne, who's Indeed. his equivalent in the French government, and this is a, because we're marking the anniversary of the Entente Cordiale. Uh, so this is a sort of post-Brexit statement that France and Britain can still work together on the world stage. Mm. So a, a lot of politics in that as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Can I, what, why is Sunak starving himself? Oh, so so it's to do with... The, the, essentially, he's been on some sort of uh, weight loss programme, and so he's been not eating Sunak. appropriately. And so what I've heard is many of the ministerial colleagues are he's saying because angry. He's, he's angry, partly because he's angry because of the polls, but he's angry because he's, he's hungry. Eating. <laughs> oh, he's doing yeah. the fasting, isn't he? He's he not, is. not eating for 16 hours That's a day, right. and then you break your fast again, and it's great for weight loss, apparently. Yeah. He 
doesn't need to... Well, there we go. We'll talk about that no. another day, I'm sure. <laughs> Ava, uh, front page of the mail. Uh, Rainer's making a fool of you, Keir, says a Tory chairman. Yeah, this is the story that Labour were hoping would have gone away about a month ago, <laughs> I think, and it's it's still persevering. So, yes, yeah, so this is the story that uh, Angela Rayner sold her house in... 2015, and she was on the electoral roll as living in that house, but um, actually it, it seemed that she was living potentially a mile away with her husband and children who were registered in the house, um, yeah, five years previous to that, actually. So she should have paid capital gains tax, is the argument. Um, she maintains that she didn't have to, and she received advice at the time that said she didn't have to. She hasn't revealed that advice. Why hasn't she? She could just make all this go away if she revealed that email. I think this is this is tricky because it, it's also tied into sort of uh, Le Labour's leader's office politics and I think that Keir Starmer and has basically taken a view that um, we're, we're going to say that you have received advice and we're not going to receive that advice and we're going to push the line that we are not in government and we are being held to too to, to high of a standard so leave us alone. Um, and she's sort of under at the behest, I think, of a few press do, do officers rather than that, actually that her own. Do you not complying with the law is important, even when you're in opposition? Well, look, well, I, I, well I'd be putting me on trial here. <laughs> I would <laughs> say that it would be good trial. to. But, I mean, <laughs> so, well, <laughs> let, Freddie, let's just ask you because <laughs> I think this isn't going away either. I do think it's a big deal. I certainly talking to many of our viewers over the weekend, they think it's a big deal. Yeah. Is it a big deal? Uh, is it a big deal that somebody who wants to be an important person can... Yes, I mean, I think if you've, if you've messed up, uh, and particularly if you've covered it up, which it seems a little bit like she has, uh, then, yes, she probably will have to go. I mean, the, the, the left, if I can talk in such generic terms, uh, the left is sort of making out this is just a right-wing hobby horse, and, and to an extent it is. But I think Rainer made a big mistake a couple of weeks ago where she really went on the front foot. She did a sort of media blitz... Yeah. saying, oh, I've done nothing wrong, this is a smear job, this smear attack against me. Um, but obviously she has uh, messed up and she's not going to uh, reveal all her tax returns. She says for family reason, why should I, why should I, you know, if I've got family, why should the public be able to look into my family yeah. affairs and so on? I don't think that's going to wash for long enough. And if the, if the press keep going on at her, which they will now, because she sort of invited this attack, uh, then I think she, she may have to uh, be removed. I think her argument is that it's such a, a, a tiny bit of money compared to... That's sort irrelevant. Of, no, it's no, irrelevant. Sorry, I'm just presenting sorry. her argument. Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'm not defending... I'll get back in my box. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Her argument is it's such a... a How dare bit of money. you? Sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, compared to, say, what Nadine Zahawi hadn't declared or hadn't paid on his tax bill. But, but, you She's can't, but that, here yeah. we go again. Surely all politicians should be held to the same measures no, and no, account. Yeah. And this I is would what, agree. But I think people around the country are thinking, not more sleeves. It doesn't matter which party is. But for goodness sake, get your affairs in order. Well, speaking about people around the country and what they're thinking, we asked you, is uh, the interest into Angela Rayner's tax affairs justified? Layla got in touch to say Rayner has had her taxes audited and reviewed. I don't see any point in attacking well, her. Well, no. Has she had them audited? I'm just putting Indeed. Layla's uh, position across. Uh, I don't see any point in attacking her for selling an ex-council house. Now, Doddy says Rayner's quick enough to call out other MPs for the slightest mistake, so she has to be held to account too. I think that's a very important message as well. Joanne Anna texted her views, and you can do that. Uh, you can text the word talk in your message to 8722. She did that. She says Raina needs to come clean, and it's nothing to do with her being a woman or northern. There you are, Nicola Thorpe. I didn't say anything. I just <laughs> asked a question. I do think the key point there is her previous sanctimony about, sanctimony about other people's tax affairs, which, you know, that does come back to bite you if you're not completely yeah, squeaky sure. clean yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the Definitely. problem is, is it, did she do it by accident, and then it's got out of hand now, or was it intentional? Yeah. And I think that that nuance is now lost because they didn't come out at the beginning and just just admit that you might have done something wrong. Yeah, for sure. Right, Freddie, we're going to move on to another story now. Front page of The Express, an expose into care homes uh, and a crisis that's putting Britain to shame. Yeah, well, this is a... Um, I don't want to sound sniffy about The Express, but this is, a, like, a very, very big, important story on the front page of The Express, uh, which is great because it, normally you think it's just sort of doing the Tory party's comms. Mm. Um, perhaps it is in a more complicated way, but we'll, we'll find out. Uh, it's just this is the fact that one in five sites that is um, allocated for care, adult care, which is the most pressing mm. issue in some ways domestically, um, <sighs> is inadequate. Uh, it means that we have a, 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 well, we have an aging population. Um, it is an extremely expensive mm. thing to look mm. after our aging population. 
we don't have the resources, we don't have the funding to do it, and nobody quite knows how we're going to do it. And I think perhaps what's going on here a little bit is that uh, there's another story today, I think it's in The Telegraph, about how Labour um, have... Uh, they have care home proposals, they but do. they haven't budgeted them. Um, so they, their proposals could cost tens of billions, uh, and they have no suggestions as to how they'll pay for it. And, and Ava, this is, this is the point, isn't it? Social care has been under or has been neglected for a very long time. It's really important. We have an increasingly ageing population, as Freddie says. Also, we don't pay carers enough, in my humble opinion. We don't attract people into care. And actually, looking after older people is really important. Yeah, which is extraordinary when you when you think about how much these private uh, care homes actually make. You know, they're, they're extremely profitable. Some of them are turning over millions. Not, the not all ones, of them. The private ones, sorry. Yeah, at not the top, all of them. At the top and of the and scale. many actually don't. But, some of them run at a loss. Mm, but do you know that this was identified as a problem a couple of years ago. We were going to have this health and social care levy that was going to be introduced and that was going to be part of your national insurance. And so, you know, the government have been conscious that this has been an issue for, for a good couple of years. I just think about, you know, when we get older, like, we're going to have not a, you know... Not Robot, a, nothing, nothing left. <laughs> nothing left. Robot carers. We well, need robot yes, carers. Which the have solution. a day off. I read yesterday. Yeah. Did you see that? Yes. I did see that. <laughs> yeah, robots but have to have a day off one <laughs> one day a week. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, really? well Labour's policy is that they say they're going to stop using the sort of sticking plaster of cheap migrant labour to do care because that's what we do in Britain, uh, and sort of make it more and provide incentives for British people to get involved in in adult social care. But this will be extremely expensive, and, and that's mm. the point, is they haven't funded it. I want to rush us on to a story in the story in the Guardian um, about this British athlete who's become the first to run the full length of Africa, Ava. I've got to be honest, everyone's been talking about this for a really long time and I totally didn't engage in it at all. <laughs> so some guy called the Hardest Geezer or something like that has been running the entire continent of Africa. How I'm long has like, he been doing it for? Well, nearly a year, I think. Oh, my isn't goodness. He? Yeah. But, um, and also he, by the way, uh, sends his best wishes to you. And he's going to be on Mike Graham show, uh, actually, later this morning. No, no, no. Don't, hang on a minute. It's an amazing feat. It's an amazing feat. He's done all these marathons. Totally he's gone wonderful. around Africa or the length of Africa. But it's just, it's just sort of this thing has been going on and I feel, I feel like it's been going on while, like, the, the entire world has been like you know turned upside down sure. and this guy's still been running but he was know. also running through parts of the world that are being turned upside down he got mugged at gunpoint didn't he he did the hardest geezer mugged at gunpoint yes the hardest geezer. his story. efforts have raised more than six hundred thousand pounds for charity do we know what the charity is no not no. sure but, um, but anyway, I'll be back shortly, so maybe I'll find I'll find out <laughs> by then. Do you know then. what? If well, you can bring that information it. back to us, that would be fantastic. I mean, I think it's an incredible feat, actually, doing it for charity. I know he wanted to do it as well. I think there was some story about he's had a, a child since he started doing this. I think, just read it. I think there's something in there. He's well, basically missed you know, out a year of his life. I'm, yeah. I knew he was problematic. Well, there we, go. we go. Just read that. Double check that. <laughs> he was that's, running that's away from real, something. Uh, yeah. Thank yeah. you very much indeed to Ava. Thanks, Ava and, and Freddie. Freddie. They'll be back in just under an hour. Now you've been getting in touch with all your views and opinions. Yes, as we were talking about <laughs> there, Labour's deputy leader Angela Rayner has faced questions over whether she paid the right amount of tax uh, on the 2015 sale of a council house due to confusion over whether or not it was her principal residence. Pam says transparency is so important for our political class. I'm sick of MPs being let off. I don't care if they belong to the Labour Party or the Tories. What I do know is that I've worked hard and paid the highest tax without a miss. If I dodged my taxes, even by 20 quid, I would have been held to account. But why not the politicians? It's a good point. It's a very good point, indeed. Also, I don't know if you are aware there are more train strikes taking place for almost uh, two years. These have been going on, by the oh. way. So who is to blame for this? If you remember, the RMT settled for a deal. This is Aslef, who are still on strike. Many of you very angry about this. Logan says, oh, I feel so messed around with all the strikes. I bought a moped. Happy days, yes. And Sean says, well, uh, it actually costs less to fly than to get a train ticket now. How right you are. Uh, Otis says, my younger brother is a train driver. He earns 90k a year for a four-day week. Great money, right? It sounds like there might be a little bit of sibling jealousy there, Otis. Yeah, Otis doesn't really get on with his brother, I'm <laughs> guessing. <laughs> or maybe his brother pays for everything. And Luke says, uh, the government's privatised the railways. Like everything else, so profits go to foreign investors and not on new trains and lines that would make fares cheaper.
Wow. We'll talk about this later, actually. We'll talk about the government subsidies to the rail network and how much you and we are spending keeping the railways going. Well, moving on now, and a manhunt continues after a 27-year-old woman died after being stabbed in broad daylight while pushing her baby in a pram in Bradford. The police are trying to track down a 25-year-old man called Habir, uh, Habir, uh, Habir Massam, who is wanted over the attack that took place on Saturday afternoon. Well, joining us now is former Detective Superintendent Shabnam Chowdhury. Good morning, Shabnam. Thank you so much for joining us. Can you tell us what the latest is on the attacker's whereabouts? Well, the police don't actually know his whereabouts and uh, one day may not seem a lot of time to many people, but in the life of a murder investigation, that's a significant amount of loss of evidence and the golden hours, which are really crucial at this time. The police will be looking at CCTV, any digital footprint that he may have left behind in terms of where he's gone. They've taken the unusual step of naming naming a potential suspect, which is just as you've mentioned, Habib or Masoum. Um, and they've released some CCTV footage. Um, but what is really interesting is that both parties are believed to have been known to each other. So they'll be looking um, very carefully into that relationship, family, what the, the next of kin is with these two. And they'll be working with family members, witnesses, community members to see if they can find him. It does seem at this stage quite unusual that he seems to have disappeared into thin air. Um, he's got connections in Burnley and Chester, as I understand it. So police will be doing a painstaking, um, you know, uh, Suit like real deep, deep dive into uh, CCTV footage because that would be the best timeline for them. And of course, there are two very main potential things here. One is that he could have gone to ground in rural areas or with family members or friends, or two, they would definitely have put out an all ports warning to ensure that he doesn't abscond abroad to any other country. And Shabnam, what do we know about the baby? We understand that the victim here was pushing a child uh, when she was killed. Do we know anything about the child at all? Not at this stage. Uh, the child is safe, thank goodness. Safe. That's the most okay. important thing, yeah. yes. Um, unharmed, um, a mother and child walking along the road as any normal parent would do and then subjected to absolutely horrific and fatal injuries. And uh, unfortunately, the child was unharmed. So this will be a very fast moving investigation for the police who will be working very closely with other forces, but also with local communities, businesses and partners. And they will be making some strong appeals around dash cam and other witnesses to come forward. There will be people out there that know this individual and know him quite well. And if they are protecting him, then they will throw the full force of the law at them too. Well said indeed. As you said right at the beginning, we believe, or the police believe, he was known to the victim. A knife was found at the scene of the crime as well. What else do we know? Uh, we believe he's from the Oldham area. He's described as Asian of slim build. We've seen the picture there. We also saw the CCTV picture. So from the clothing, these are pretty, uh, these are pretty remarkable. That stands out, particularly that top, doesn't it? Absolutely, but I suspect that um, he would have discarded that clothing by now. You know, there's um, potentially there's a weapon outstanding. He may have changed his appearance quite a bit by now. He has a beard in that particular picture. Who's to say that he hasn't completely changed his uh, appearance? Um, and he could be milling around with members of the public. Um, you know, like I say, one day in the life of an investigation as serious as this is a significant amount of time. So police will be concerned as to where he is and who is actually uh, potentially protecting him or if he's actually managed to leave the UK, because that's always another uh, option. If this individual had pre-planned this attack, knew where he was going at that particular time, then he knew where he was going to be going after that. Right. And Shabnam, just really quickly, what's the advice to the general public if they were to recognise him in public? Yeah, call the emergency services, but do not approach um, at all and just uh, give a running commentary, if you can, as to his location and whereabouts. Uh, and can I just ask you, here we go again, more knife crime on our streets. What is going on in the United Kingdom? Also, how concerned should we be? We seem to hear about these attacks almost on a daily, if not weekly, basis. I think two things. One, police have got to work better with local communities. But two, the criminal justice systems allow these individuals to get away with it because the sentences are so poor and low. Prisons are overflowing. So these individuals don't even get custodial sentences. 
just go back out and carry on carrying knives and commit absolutely horrific offences. And that's from the young to the older. But the younger generation are generally the ones that tend to carry weapons. Shabnam, really good to talk to you as always. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. That's former Detective Superintendent Shabnam Chowdhury. Well, still to come, Kinsey joins us with all the latest on the Royals. That's right. We're one month away from Prince Harry touching down in the UK to celebrate the Invictus Games. Could this mean a highly anticipated royal reunion? I'll have all the details next. This is Talk Today. Good morning. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. The time is 6.51. Now, a royal reunion could be on the cards as Prince Harry is reportedly planning to make peace with his brother William. Well, the brothers haven't been seen together in nearly a year. But the announcement of King Charles and Princess Catherine's cancer diagnoses could bring the pair back together. So they say, well, Kinsey Schofield is in Los Angeles for us. Kinsey, I've heard this a lot. I've heard this so many times. But... Is this right? Maybe there is some truth in this. Because actually, when uh, you're confronted as a family with illness and, mm. and two members of your family with an illness, maybe that sort of focused the minds. Yeah, I think it's absolutely a possibility. And I don't want to be unprofessional right now, but I do think we all need to acknowledge how beautiful Nicola's hair looks. Like the hair <laughs> gods have touched, like personally Fine. touched Kinsey, her today. Stop and it. <laughs> <laughs> you look so good. Thank you. Um, but no, I, I, I think that the, you're making a really great point. This is a very, um, you know, this is a very 
traumatizing time for the family. And I think that Prince Harry must feel a lot of guilt being so far away and feeling so disconnected. Uh, now, this is Richard Fitzwilliams talking to the son saying, you know, the, the Sussexes do like to surprise the family. They don't really tell people what their plans are ahead of time. So maybe Prince Harry is planning something when he comes out uh, May 8th to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Invictus Games. However, Prince William is going to need a heads up. Uh, Prince William, security wise and with everything that's going on, uh, he would certainly know that Prince Prince Harry wanted to have some sort of conversation, but no time like the present to reconnect and, and to heal some wounds. And what do we know about his visit to the UK? We know it's the 10th anniversary of the Invictus Games, but how is that going to be celebrated? Well, it's going to be celebrated at a service at St. Paul's Cathedral. And actually, Nicola, we're not really supposed to have this information. And according to some sources close to the Sussexes, they're unhappy that we have it because of Prince Harry's issue with security. They would rather the public know a little bit later in the game so that Prince Harry can get the approval for the type of security he'd like or, you know, so they can at least make those arrangements so that he feels safe and prepared. We don't know when he's going to land and when he's going to leave and what his full schedule is but we do anticipate to see him at the anniversary service for the Invictus Games 10 years at St Paul's Cathedral on May 8th. Amazing stuff so just so just in terms of that dynamic with Harry and William and the King for example I mean we know the King is very fond of his son he is his son he's also a councillor of state and I do wonder whether it's actually the, the difficult bit will be the patch up with William rather than the patch up with the King. I agree. I think that, um, you know, Prince William is so protective of him and his family right now. He just experienced the horrific Kate Gate, all of that chaos um, that uh, inevitably led to a woman having to go on international television and, and give us her latest uh, doctor's update, which is ridiculous. So I do think that Prince William is going to be much more protective of you know, this, the, their privacy at this point in time. And when Prince Harry did come out, he flew out immediately to see the king when we found out the king had cancer. Uh, pr he did go on TV later on ABC News and, and talk about it a little bit. So Prince William might be more hesitant than the king to have that one-on-one -on -one time with him. And do you think we'd know if they all met up, Kinsey, or do you think that there might even be behind closed doors meetings to, to kind of keep away from the eye of the press? I think that that would be the ultimate test, you know, okay, we're going to see you. And if any of this gets out, then we know that we, that this, we can't ever do this again, yeah. or we know that things are headed in the right direction. I think that that would be a great test and it would be in everyone's benefit to keep it a secret. And, and just very quickly, because time is running out, but how much of this is about Harry feeling torn, do you think, wanting to come back to the UK, his wife not wanting to be here? I mean, I think that he, I think a lot of it is feeling guilt about the, his family going through something very heavy and him not being there for them. Um, but he also really wants to have a presence in the UK and he wants to continue to celebrate the Invictus Games where it began. There we go. Very interesting. Well, we'll have to see what happens on May the 8th. Well, 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 thank you so much, Kinsey, for joining us this morning. Your hair looks fabulous too. Well, lots more <laughs> what about still. Mine? Uh, yeah, no, very, yours never looks anything short of perfection. That's very kind. Lots more still to come on Talk Today. Amy Winehouse's biopic Back to Black premieres tonight in London. We'll be speaking to the Sun on Sunday's showbiz editor for all the latest. We certainly will. This is Talk Today. A very good morning to you. <laughs>he would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Quite yay. right, too. 
It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. You might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, miss it. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with David Ball and Nicola Thorpe. A very good morning to you. It is 7 o'clock now on Monday the 8th of April. You're with Talk Today on TV, radio, online and your smart speaker. Here are your top stories this morning. Troops are withdrawn from Khan Yunus, raising fears whether Israel might uh, target somewhere else next as Lord Cameron sends a clear message to the Prime Minister. Angela Rayner's tax row deepens. Labour's deputy leader faces allegations she registered the wrong property as her main home. And the Amy Winehouse biopic, Back to Black, has its premiere tonight. But it's not been without criticism and controversy. We'll get a review of the film later this hour. And after a warm but wet and windy weekend, it still looks unsettled for today and, in fact, for most of the week. I'll have all the details for you in the forecast a little later. Cheers, Naz. Now it's time for your headlines with Emily. Thank you, Nicola. Good morning. The Israeli military says it's reducing its number of troops in southern Gaza, but it's not thought to be a sign that the war may be coming to an end. It's feared Israel could now be turning its focus onto Rafah, where hundreds of thousands of civilians are sheltering. Yesterday, the British Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, said UK support for Israel isn't conditional after an Israeli attack on an aid convoy that left seven people dead. Well, former NATO commander Chris Parry is told Talk Today Israel's under pressure to deliver more targeted operations. Israel's been very successful in taking out quite a lot of Hamas fighters so far. They've destroyed most of the tunnels in the northern two-thirds uh, of Gaza uh, and now have to go uh, much more carefully into the south because there's so much of the Gazan population there. So I think... Some of the international pressure has told there has been a change in military tactics. More than 90 people have died in a ferry accident off Mozambique in southwest Africa. Officials say five people were rescued, but it's possible as many as 130 people were on board. They say the boat was overcrowded with people fleeing a cholera outbreak and was unsuited to carrying passengers and ended up sinking. Here, a major manhunt continues after a young mum was stabbed and killed while pushing her baby in a pram in Bradford. The 27-year-old was stabbed a number of times on Saturday afternoon and died later in hospital. Well, police say Habiba Masum is wanted over the attack. They say he was known to the victim but won't confirm how. Police also say he shouldn't be approached. 
Boeing is under investigation after a plane part fell during takeoff yesterday in the U.S., striking a wing cap. The Southwest flight was departing from Denver with 135 passengers on board when an engine cowling detached. It managed to turn back and landed safely. It follows other manufacturing and safety concerns at Boeing. And a charity is calling for tanning salons to have graphic warning signs similar to those found on cigarette package packages to warn customers about the dangers of using sunbeds. Skin Cancer UK says the move could save lives and is calling on the government to update legislation and make warning signs mandatory. It's estimated there are almost 17,000 cases of melanoma in the UK each year. Those are the headlines. I'll have another update in an hour. Thank you very much indeed, Emily. On to our top story today. Israel's defence minister says troops have been withdrawn from southern Gaza, raising fears that their next target could be Rafah. Well, the news comes as the Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, says that Britain's support for Israel is not unconditional following the killing of seven aid workers. Well, joining us now is Director of War on One, Assad Raymond. Assad, uh, just in terms of where we are this morning, we heard the IDF saying troops have been withdrawn from southern Gaza. There's just one brigade left there. And he also went on to say that troops are actually preparing for future operations. What does that mean, do you think, for the 1.8 million people who are seeking refuge in southern Gaza? Well, I think what it means is uh, is more violence, more death, as you rightly said. You know, the majority of the Palestinian people in, in Gaza now have been internally displaced. They're trapped into an area smaller than the size of Heathrow Airport without food, sanitation. Um, and, uh, and we've now seen, of course, the six-month mark being reached horrific numbers of people being killed, close to 50,000 if we include probably the many people who are under the rubble, 70% of them are women and children. Um, I think the voice is around the world quite clearly and quite rightly now are calling for an immediate ceasefire, that we have to end this violence, to end this indiscriminate killing of, of innocent Palestinian men, women and children. I, th I think it's important to say those deaths, the 33,000 deaths in Gaza and 75,000 injured are figures from Hamas. They haven't actually been audited, but those are the numbers they are giving. You're right in that uh, the language is changing. Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, says the nation remains appalled. He's calling for the immediate humanitarian pause and then a ceasefire. Also, Cameron now saying the response from the UK or the aid to Israel or, or, the, or the relationship with Israel is not unconditional. We've seen all these protests in Israel as well, haven't we? What does that do for Netanyahu? He's looking increasingly isolated, particularly when you see the family of Elad Katsir, this 47-year-old man who uh, very sadly was killed in Gaza, but his sister blaming Israeli authorities for not brokering a peace deal. Well, uh, and that's been true for quite a while, that a number of uh, Israeli families of hostages have been also protesting, saying that the Israeli uh, Defence Force and the Israeli government's strategy in, in Gaza, which seems to be uh, indiscriminate scale of violence, I mean, it's unprecedented. We've seen, you know, a record number of the most ever in, in modern history of journalists killed, aid workers killed, medics killed, children killed. I mean, it's it's on every single level. The, what we thought were the rules of war have been broken and, uh, and international law seems to be lying in ruin. So it's quite right now that there is these growing voices saying this must come to an end. There must be, um, and the international community must intervene. And we must see a resolution, not only, of course, of this immediate conflict, but ultimately of the illegal occupation of the Palestinian territories and, uh, and, and the right of both Israelis and Palestinians to be able to live with justice and freedom and security. And Assad, you obviously work, um, you're a director of War on Want. You come from a charitable background and presumably you want to see a future that involves peace. We've seen that Netanyahu now rejecting the idea of a two-state solution. From your personal opinion and your experience having worked with people um, connected to the area, do you think a two-state solution is actually possible or either that both sides actually want to achieve that peace? Well, look, uh, I mean, it's the right of absolutely everyone to be able to live with freedom. And this is a UN resolution. Uh, we have to remember that the UN, you know, uh, partitioned 
what is now called Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories and guaranteed the Palestinians a right to a state. And that was guaranteed again when in the Oslo agreements. And since then, we've seen a brutal occupation. I mean, people um, forget that, for example, Gaza had been under a, an illegal blockade for 15 years. Uh, the West Bank and Gaza that, uh, have been under occupation since 1967. Uh, that has to stop. I mean, and it's not just... Uh, occupation in abstract terms. I mean, every part of Palestinian life is is governed by the Israeli uh, state, whether that be your right to move, your right to marry, uh, the right to go from one town to the next town. And we, of course, seen in the West Bank increasing numbers of Israeli settlers, extremist settlers seizing land and, and displacing people from their homes. Uh, uh, Asad, can I just, uh, Asad, I just need to jump in because Nicola spoke about the two-state solution. Is that the answer there? We know Hamas also will not entertain a two-state solution. They seem to be intractable. When we're looking at these ceasefire talks which are taking place with the US, with the Qataris, with Egypt, Israel and Hamas, by by the way, they're not talking directly to each other. They're poles apart in what they want to achieve in terms of Hamas and Israel. And to be fair to Israel, Israel has a point. There is a deal on the table. Hamas won't entertain that either. Look, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not here to either defend or or, uh, or or try and articulate what the position of both the Israeli state or Hamas is in these negotiations. But, you know... Um, uh, what we do, what we need, is a lasting ceasefire, and that does mean that what cannot happen, and what many people are worried about, is not simply about that the end of this sequence of violence, but that this will be an opportunity that Israel uses to change the demographics of Gaza. I displace people permanently from the north of Gaza. Remember, it's a tiny territory, one of the proudest places in the world, to push people either out of Gaza uh, for, for, for in the long run. And so, yes, these were, troops must withdraw. Yes, we must have open and full humanitarian access. But yes, and also we must allow the UN and international human rights experts in to be able to document exactly what's been taking place over these last six months. That, And, of course, the hostages need to be released, mm. not just the Israeli hostages being held by Hamas, but also... Also, the Palestinian hostages. We've seen at the at present something like 430 children that have been arrested by the Israelis uh, without charge, without trial. Thousands of Palestinians, both in the West Bank and Gaza, have been detained, including medics. We've seen reports of torture of these of, of these detainees. Uh, so, what's very very clear is that there are violations taking place uh, without. Uh, with full impunity, and that cannot uh, be allowed to continue. So, yes, we must have a ceasefire as the first step, and then we must find a real resolution, which, of course, means an end to the occupation. And do you see that happening? Uh, Israel's response, and I will put Israel's side of it, is they say we cannot negotiate with terrorists. This was an act of terror. Look, uh, I mean, the 7th of October is a horrific moment, uh, and absolutely horrific, but... Um, it is, of course, not just the only horror that has been inflicted. We have seen now, you know, nearly 100 years of ethnic cleansing. We've seen massacre after massacre. We've seen violence after violence, uh, many of those dead being the Palestinian people. So there has to be a resolution. Now, clearly, Israel, the current Israeli government, is full of far-right extremists who said absolutely there is no way that they're going to allow a Palestinian state to exist. This is what international law says must happen, that there must be a Palestinian law. This is what UN resolutions say. This is what the UK government's policy is, what the US Ameri Ameri administration's policy is. But no international community and is able to pressure Israel to be able to get to the negotiating table and deliver that. that. So that is a bigger question for the international community as to why we have not seen a resolution of this, of this crisis for so many years. And we're after... Whenever this Gaza horror ends, we cannot go back to uh, the status quo. That's very, very clear. That that it, we must find a resolution. We must find a way that the one point, not just the one point one million people in 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 Gaza, but also the millions of Palestinians, both in the West Bank and those who are in refugee camps all around the world, have some future. Mm -hmm. And until you guarantee people the right to some future, I think we're going to see this cycle of violence continue and continue.
Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Asad Raymond there, Director of The War on Run. Thank you. Uh, the War on Want, sorry. Uh, well, let's take a look at some of this morning's front pages. Now, The Telegraph focuses on Lord Cameron's warning to the US over blocking aid to Ukraine, claiming that they're risking the security of the West. Now, The Times leads on the rise of the 24-hour wait for a bed in A&E as more than 150,000 patients waited more than one day for a hospital bed last year. Unbelievable. And The Mail says that Rainer's making a fool of you, Keir, as the Labour leader faces criticism for his unwillingness to probe claims against his deputy's property dealings. Well, sticking with that Angela Rayner story now, as Labour's deputy leader's tax affairs were in the spotlight for most of the weekend, following those claims about a second home. While well, Shadow Foreign Secretary David Lammy has now jumped to Rayner's defence, claiming it's all a smear that's designed to distract us from the Tory chaos. Well, Times Radio presenter James Hansen and Poppy Coburn, assistant US opinion editor at the Daily Telegraph, uh, join us. James, we were talking about this earlier. I've, I've been on air all weekend. This Angela Rayner story, much as Labour wants it to go away, it's not going away. No. Big investigation by the Mail on Sunday. It's incredibly detailed, that article. And what I can't work out is Labour could make this story go away. Look, I have a, a certain degree of sympathy with Angela Rayner. Like many families up and down the country, she, you know, at one point had quite a complicated personal life and, you know, was probably living between different homes. And that's fine. And, and actually, capital gains tax is quite confusing and probably a lot of people don't pay it when they should or should pay it when they don't need to. So fair enough. Had she just from the get-go said, you know what, HMRC, tell me if I do need to pay something, I'll submit all the evidence again. If I need to pay something, I'll stump up whatever it is. And in the grand scheme of things, we think if it was actually a second home, not a primary residence, should have had to pay about £1,500, which is not an insubstantial amount of money, but in the grand scheme of things, isn't the biggest. But instead, she said she's done nothing wrong but refused to publish this independent advice that she so say has received. Well, if she just published this independent advice, we don't know who it's from, by the way, if she published it, then surely the story would go away. Poppy, just want to bring Poppy uh, in down the line there. What's your take on this story? And do you think that Angela Rayner should publish the advice that she was given? Have we got Poppy there? No, she's frozen. Um, let, let's just go back to you, James, about this, because you, you mentioned there in a very offhand manner, it's only one and a half thousand pounds, that when people are eating their breakfast this morning, it's not about the money, it's about the spirit of the law. Did yeah. she break the law? Now, you've got a woman who could be Deputy Prime Minister, who may have actually, this, uh, if she has broken the law, then that's fraud. She also has, we believe, claimed a single person discount on that home. Again, that would not be right. You cannot have politicians breaking the law. And that goes for all parties, actually. And it's the charge of hypocrisy that is politically dangerous for Labour, because Angela Rayner has been very critical of Conservative politicians demanding transparency over their tax affairs. And you may say, fair enough, absolutely. You know, where there are questions that need to be answered, politicians should be transparent. But if you believe in transparency for your political opponents, you have to be prepared to be transparent yourself, even if it is over what in the grand scheme of things may be a relatively small tax bill. And do you think it's going to go away? Well, not at the moment. <laughs> I think they need to change strategy. And I know there will be Labour people, uh, people watching this thinking, why are people talking about Angela Rayner's tax affairs again? Well, they can make the story go away. <laughs> this is but what... they're not. But they're not. And David Lammy is now supporting her as well. Keir Starmer, very quiet at this point. I mm. do wonder, just, you know, with, with your expert hat on, what does this do in terms of the polls. We've said consistently, Labour's poll lead, I think, is soft. It, I mean, it's clearly very significant indeed. I think it's soft. But as, as we come towards the local elections, which are taking place, we're in Perder at the moment, as we move towards a general election, does it shift public opinion? I don't think it does, to be really honest. I think that at the moment, whilst there are some voters who'll be paying attention to it, you know, the dissatisfaction with the government is at such a point that I, I think it would be very hard to have any one thing like this shift that. I think you're right. I think you will see between now and the election, whenever that is, that the Labour poll leads start to come down. I don't think they're going to win the election by 25 points, which is what the current polls show mm. they're ahead by. But I don't think one story like this is going to change it. But what it might do is just sow a few further doubts about Labour, because the problem they've got is, whilst there is a huge amount of dissatisfaction with the Conservatives, there is no great love for Keir Starmer or for mm. the Labour Party still. You know, it is a vote against the government at the moment, not a vote in favour of Labour. Do you think it could even go as far as to say that it might work in some demographics, actually in Angela Rayner's 
favour. You know, it highlights the fact that she does come from a, or has a mm. blended family. It highlights and, and it kind of promotes the idea that she did have a council house at one point. Perhaps this is something that people could, some from some de demographics, yeah. actually identify with. Well, she's been compared sometimes to John Prescott. Right. You know, because she's an authentic working class voice. Obviously, the fact they're both deputy leader of the Labour Party, or he was, you know, is one of the reasons. And of course, when John Prescott punched that bloke who threw an egg at him, <laughs> Actually, a lot of people thought, well, good on you. You know, and it kind of endeared him more but, but, to parts very of the, different. Let's, of the let, We've got Poppy back, actually. Let, let's ask you, Poppy, you missed out on our earlier discussion, but Angela Rayner here, digging in. We've got David, David Lammy supporting her now. This goes back to the crux of the matter for me, which is, which was her primary residence? Did she break the law, yes or no? And what is the implication of breaking the law if you've made a £48,500 profit and you don't pay any tax on that, when maybe you should have paid the tax on that? Well, you're absolutely right. This is a credibility issue. It's not necessarily about the size of the figure. It's not whether or not that she's been living in a council house or whether or not she's representative of the people of the country. It's that she seems to not be willing to actually tell people what's going on. She's giving the public assurances, but not actually backing them up with any evidence. It doesn't matter how much money is involved. It doesn't matter how long ago this actually happened or whether or not capital gains tax is confusing, and obviously it is. It's the fact that the whole party machine seems to have gone round to try and protect Angela Rayner, telling her that she's done nothing wrong and doing exactly what the Labour Party accuses the Tories of doing, which is rather than actually offering some real solid solutions or some solid facts, saying, well, look at the other party. The other party is behaving very badly. Let's pay attention to them instead. Well, no, I'm sorry. That's not what the issue is here. The issue is whether or not Angela Rayner has been entirely honest with the public and whether or not she's made a mistake or perhaps it's been more malicious than that. Now, we cannot come to that conclusion unless she actually releases these documents, unless she actually gives people insurance. And I'm sorry to David Lammy, I, I don't actually think that people are at this stage, I think we're on week three of this scandal, are feeling particularly sympathetic. This story is not going away. Labour has to give people a clear answer. And Poppy, obviously she denies all wrongdoing, but if later on down the line she is found to have either you know done something wrong or done something by mistake how do you think that could play out to the electorate i don't think this is a particularly serious issue where we would be you know talking about people standing down or some kind of scandal within the party i mean obviously she's deputy leader so that's a position that keir starmer can't easily actually remove her from but again i don't think the scope of this issue is a problem in, in, in and of itself I actually think the biggest scandal now is that this story has been going on for such a long time and it will damage her long-term credibility, whether or not people feel that Angela Rayner is someone who is completely frank, completely open and honest with the public. So the longer they let this story chandel on, because, again, I don't think it's going away, clearly the Mail are continuing to release um, more and more information surrounding this story, the worse that will look for her credibility. The actual issue at stake here is not some major scandal, career-ending scandal, in my opinion. And, and let's just move very quickly, because uh, state pension and universal credit increase, uh, the government desperate for some good news. This is good news for pensioners, because it's linked, the triple lock, uh, inflation, 2.5%, average earnings. It, it's good. It means that people will get more money. If you're on the state pension, it will go up 8.5% to... Uh, an extra £900 a year. Is that good enough for Rishi Sunak? Poppy. Well, I think it's a very good increase. You know, pensioners, it's also universal credit, so people who are receiving some kind of form of state welfare have done quite well out of this. We obviously know about the triple lock. Um, has given us a pretty major increase in pensions this year. The problem does come down to who is really suffering at the moment, and that's not to overlook pensioner poverty. But people who are earning a salary, earning wages, many, the millions of people who, through fiscal drag, have been dragged into a higher band of tax, they are the people who are not benefiting from this Conservative government at the moment. Now, the people who are actually still willing to vote for the Conservative Party, I think there's probably only one block left, and that will be the elderly, that will be pensioners. So obviously they need to shore up support with that voting block. But in terms of the long-term health of the party, it's not really enough to just be able to say, well, we've gold-plated your pensions, because people will probably be relying on those pensions for a very long very long period of time, because they won't be actually getting enough income to start saving. That's not a long-term good situation for the party.
Well, thank you so much, James Hansen from Times Radio here in the studio and Poppy Coburn from The Telegraph down the line. Well, still to come on Talk Today, struck out rail unions prepare to walk out this morning in a two-year pay dispute. And the couple that boozes together stays together. Why those in a relationship live longer if they both drink alcohol? Wow. Ava Santina from Politics Journal, the Spectator's Freddie Gray. Take us through the papers. That's next. This is Talk Today. The time, 7.22. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that, that oh, a, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. The time is 7.25. We'll have the weather for you in just a moment, but here's what else is coming up in today's programme. Well, boozing couples apparently live longer. People in a relationship where both partners drink alcohol tend to live longer. That's <laughs> We'll be discussing that more in the papers <laughs> next. certainly will. And Amy's back. The Amy Winehouse biopic, Back to Black, premieres tonight. The Sun on Sunday showbiz editor, Hannah Hope, joins us with more details. That is at 7.40. And Liverpool stumble in the title race after drawing with Manchester United yesterday. Talk Sports' Jim White joins us just before 8am with all the latest from the weekend's sporting action. But first of all, Naz, it seems brighter, it seems sunnier, it's lighter in the evenings. What's the weather like? Um, it's still going to stay unsettled, though. For some of us, yes, fine and bright. And actually, as we head into the weekend, it will become warmer again and more settled for the south. But for the north, it's generally staying quite unsettled. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. 
Hello. First of all, it was all going on this weekend. It was wet and windy. It was warm as well. We saw temperatures peak over 20 degrees Celsius for the first time this year. Now, it is going to become a little bit cooler, although temperatures are actually re returning back to average for the time of year. But it's also going to stay rather unsettled with further wet and windy weather over the next few days. But as we head into the weekend, high pressure will start to build from the south. So we will see more of a north-south divide with northern areas staying unsettled, but southern areas becoming a little bit drier, brighter and warmer, but not so the case for this morning. Across northern and western parts of England and Wales, it's a cloudy, wet and windy start, whereas across Scotland and Northern Ireland, it's fine and bright, but chilly with a bit of a frost in some spots. Now, through today, that rain will continue to move its way further northwards. There's actually a named storm by Meteo France, and it will bring a lot of wet and windy weather over the next 24 hours. But for much of mainland Scotland, for central northern areas, certainly, it will be fine and bright for this afternoon. Southern Scotland, they've seen spells of rain by mid-afternoon. Northern Ireland will be pretty wet, and there will be scraps of rain across Northwest England, Wales, down towards many southern counties of England. In fact, there will be hefty showers moving northwards across parts of the Midlands, central, southern and eastern England, but still fairly mild across parts of the southeast, up to around 17 degrees Celsius. But those showers will be heavy and thundering, could cause some localised flooding issues as they continue to drift northwards up towards parts of northern England overnight, as well as that rain heading up towards Scotland. Now, there's a warning from the Met Office for southern and eastern parts of Scotland, as there will be quite a bit of rain falling on already saturated ground. This could cause some localised flooding issues. If you're hoping to get a glimpse of the partial eclipse, I think the far north of Scotland most likely this evening. Otherwise, elsewhere, it's looking quite cloudy. And rain will continue through tomorrow to swirl around many northern and eastern parts of the UK, so cloudy and wet across parts of eastern Scotland, eastern England as well. Heavy showers, but brighter skies out towards western Scotland for tomorrow. Sunshine showers for Northern Ireland, not too heavy with those showers, though. And a few showers scattered across Wales and the west country and southern counties of England for tomorrow afternoon too. But further east and north, cloudy and wet. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Cheers, Naz. Now it's time to go through the papers once again with Ava Santina from Politics Joe and the spectator, spectators, spectators <laughs> Freddie Gray. Thank you so much for joining us again. Freddie, we're going to kick off with you. Page four of the mail. What have you got on Oliver Dowden? Well, Oliver Dowden hinting yesterday that uh, uh, an election could be as late as January. Uh, and this is this sort of Tory party... Uh, you know, when do you want to be destroyed? Question. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not even January. It's January the twenty eighth. So January twenty eighth. I mean, you can't. Oh, you've only got three days until yeah. the end of January. Pushing so, I mean, it right, that is the latest they can possibly do. Right up to the deadline, which which would make sense. And particularly, this might chime slightly with this idea that's going around that if the May the second elections are as terribly bad as everybody thinks. Uh, that Rishi Sunak might step down. And then if there's a new leader, they might want to push it... Step down right to the or wire. get pushed out. Get pushed out, yeah. Mm. I, I, some combination of the two, <laughs> yes. possibly. Yes. Mm. Uh, so I think... I mean, that would... That, a new leader would be justified, I think, in pushing back. But if it's Rishi Sunak and they push it back to January, the public are now just so fed up. They want the Tories yeah. out. The longer they keep it, the more they'll punish them for keeping it. And over a Christmas period as well. Presumably, what, there'll be a six-week campaign period before the election. Yeah, good point. Would they be allowed to campaign over Christmas? Would they take holiday? How would that work? Well, I mean, you know, they, they don't turn up to Parliament when they don't <laughs> need to. So, but, you know, but they'll quite happily go and, uh, you know, go and campaign. I think they'll be fine with that. And also, a winter election can be beneficial for the Conservatives because a lot of people do postal votes and so it's more in their favour. You know, Labour voters have to really get out of bed to go and vote, and sometimes it's quite so, hard so, to convince them to. on that note, I think, actually, the youth vote disappears because young people tend... You, you are more reticent to vote, I think, than the older person who is determined to get to those, those, uh, those postal, sta yeah. postal stations. So it will be very interesting to see what happens. Also, force is at work, without a doubt, and uh, as Freddie says, if they lose terribly in the local elections, I do believe there will be some sort of leadership challenge. Of course, we don't know how many letters have gone into the 1922 committee. Who, who could turn this around? Could anyone turn it around? I, I, I don't know. I, I genuinely don't know. I think that's the big problem about pushing him out, is that there's no natural replacement. And, you know, you're looking at the local elections and they'll be lucky or they'll be pleased if they lose between 300 and 400 seats. But then, you know, the op it could have the opposite effect. If they really hemorrhage a lot of seats up and down the country, then traditional small-c Conservative voters could look at it and go, well, actually, we need to really turn out at the general. And probably also the most ambitious, intelligent Tories do not want to lead the party 
into an election disaster. So that's the other thing to consider. Very interesting, though, isn't it? Uh, huge dynamics at work there. Yeah. And I saw Liz Truss on Wednesday, actually, and she's very much on manoeuvres, I think, as well, with the pop cons. Yeah. What? Sorry. What? Sorry to laugh. Why? Because we were Why? speaking about well, the most I mean, intelligent, uh, ambitious... Uh, Cor 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 Tories like Liz Truss. I mean, I'm not saying she would come back, but I think I think there are yeah, things no, going, sure. but, going you know, on behind the scenes. The Tories like a lot of things that they shouldn't like. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, uh, well, let's move on to things we don't like. Um, Ava, let's, uh, let's go to you now. This is about railway passengers. Here we go again. You don't like We've railway got... passengers, David? No, I love railway passengers. I, I, but, on the railway but, passengers. No, here we go again. We've got more strikes. How many strikes do we have to have in this country? And we've already had the RMT settling. The ASLEF are refusing to settle. We are subsidising the railways to the most extraordinary tune. They don't work and we need people back into work, I think. That's well, my personal. Well, are they refusing or were they refused? Because, you know, the Department for Transport is refusing to meet with them Well, they've been offered 4% plus 4%. By the way, that brings them to £65,000 for a 35-hour, four-day week, plus changes to working practices. Yes. Now, I think that actually sixty five grand to drive a train is pretty good. The problem isn't really the salary. So the salary is one component of it. The problem is that, that they're being forced to work overtime and also because staff are being cut from stations and they're being cut from, you know, maintenance and a lot of them are being cut from, um, you know, cleaners from the trains. What they're arguing is that it's actually not safe for them to operate the railway. And so one of the conditions is that they wouldn't, they wouldn't sack anyone else. They wouldn't make anyone else redundant. But, you know, look, I mean, pensions today, they got an 8%, 8.5% rise, didn't they, in, their, in the pension that they're going to receive. So why can their train driver not go for something similar? But why are we bailing out the railways? They cost us an absolute fortune. That is fortune. something I am so interested in. So Avanti, actually, mm. who's taken over a billion pounds in subsidies since the pandemic, is running... Probably one of the most support. Actually, you know, it is actually running the second second most appalling service in the country, and that could be brought under uh, government control. So, so, so I have never really understood the case for privatisation of the railways because you have to use the same infrastructure, yeah. the same tracks, and so on. It doesn't really make much sense. But when you look at how much we're spending, I think we spent uh, something ridiculous last year, sixteen billion pounds bailing out uh, the railways. It doesn't work. People are sick and tired of it. Someone's just bought a moped so they can actually circumvent. <laughs> Invent the railways. Well, Britain does seem particularly bad at public private partnerships. Uh, I think you see that with water, you see that with rail. Mm. Um, but as far as these strikes are concerned, I mean, the question is, does it end with the Labour government? And I think the answer is probably yes. Well, do you, do you think so? Because, think? I mean, well, the RMT don't uh, pay into Labour. They've actually got nothing to do with them. And they're but quite... RMT have settled. Yeah, no, but they... But, you know, but, but if there are going to be more cuts that are introduced by these private companies, then I could imagine there might be a possibility they'll go on strike again. But, you know, look, you, I think it's a really good time to consider the enormous subsidies that we're paying to them. A lot of that money is going straight to the shareholders. You know, Avanti took £12 million in profit last year and 11 million pounds of that they paid directly to their shareholders is that good use of public money absolutely not and, and one very quickly if i may so they passed legislation for minimum service levels freddie mm. that they could implement why aren't they doing that very good question uh why doesn't why don't a lot of things happen in in <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to british infrastructure um so this dispute i believe it I think it, because this dispute is long running, so it's, it, it's running before the legislation got put right. into place. I think the first union that would have been um, open to use this legislation would have been the RMT in November, but then those strikes got called off, so it was never actually implemented. There's nothing very she good. doesn't know about rail that. strikes. No, I'm very honestly. impressed. She yeah. just loves trains. <laughs> she yeah. loves trains. Uh, Freddie, we're going to move on now to page two of The Sun. £11.3 billion pounds in payments were made. Uh, sorry, was lost uh, due to fraud last year in the retail sector. This is yes, the retail sector. So shops, obviously, uh, the, uh, the average retail business lost uh, well over a thousand pounds. Obviously, a lot of companies lost a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this raises an interesting question about sort of to what extent do the credit com card companies just accept this rising level of fraud as just something they have to write off on a regular basis? Um, and what can be done about it? What can be done about cyber hacking, cyber fraud? And um, particularly, you know, as we know, it's just like consumers, older runners, people, older people who run businesses uh, are often susceptible to cyber fraud. Mm -hmm. 
just as older consumers are. It, it's so confusing, isn't it? And, and the scams are getting more and more complicated and intriguing. I had a phone call from someone only yesterday, or no, on Friday, purporting to be from a bank, for example, which we, is a, is a, which we know is a well-known scam. I refused to answer them and I asked for a number to call back and they wouldn't give me one. Well, that's very good, isn't it? You know, yeah. But the majority of crime that the, the Met Police are now working on is, is, is online fraud. It's, mm. it's huge. Have you, have you had, the, any of you had the, um, the voice that sounds like one of your family? Not yet. No, have no. You? no I haven't, but one of my colleagues did yeah. last week. So how does it's that work? Well, it sounded they, like their child. It sounds like their yeah. child and yeah. their child in distress. Um, yeah, they, they, yeah, it's very, very scary. But and you can not... get text messages saying, Mum, Mum, I need help. Yeah. And those. then the voice note saying, yeah. It's, uh, it's oh, not sophisticated enough, because if, if you ask it a question... It, it doesn't it know doesn't how to know reply to, say, to you. What, what's your but, name? Yeah, like, things like that. Yes, yeah. what's my that name? Yeah. But, it, yeah. but, but that's what will happen, presumably, in the coming years. You know, they'll be so sophisticated that they can replicate video calls, perhaps, using AI from people's facial recognition. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, it is it's very terrifying, terrifying. Indeed. Good business shall, venture. Shall we move, Ava, to this story in the eye? It's the front page. Homeowners are being told they must sign an NDA to see details of rising estate charges. Mm. This is a really big story. I think it affects an awful lot of people. And, of course, the system in this country is so ridiculous with leaseholds and freeholds, mm. uh, which is an anachronistic historical remnant. Yes, and this was going to be or supposed to be resolved in the Renters' Reform Bill. That is this huge piece of legislation that Michael Gove has been putting together. But it, doesn't, it does actually look like a lot of these people are going to be done over. So when you move into a property, you've bought this property, and you might be told a service charge for, for it is about £1,000 a year and with that you might get access to a gym or someone might, you know, look after your post, that kind of thing. And a couple of years later, that fee turns out to be an introductory fee and actually now it's going up to £16,000. And so, but you, you've got no idea, no, no way of knowing this when you move into the property because the developer doesn't have to tell you. And now this story is saying you, if you sign a, a non-disclosure agreement, you might be privy to the extortionate fees that you'll one day have to pay. That is... It's scandalous, it's, it's, Freddie. It, it is a complete scandal. And I think what it is is a lot of the... To incentivize home ownerships, a lot of these companies have got away with it because they're offering slightly cheaper properties at first, mm. but you get... Um, I'm trying to think of a word that isn't rude. You get uh, <laughs> put in, you get in trouble later. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. yes. Uh, and and uh, I know lots of people this has happened to who thought they were getting quite a good bargain on a new... It's often new build <laughs> properties and um, find that they're paying uh, unbelievable yeah. things in services. And I bought a new build and uh, the service charge has doubled and yeah. I had no oversight of what was going on. Double every month. And then they Gosh. say, well, it's the cost of energy, it's, you know, the cost of doing business. And as you rightly say, no-one knows. And yeah. you have actually no idea what's going to happen. Wow. It feels fraudulent. It feels, I, I yeah, agree. feels it does, totally fraudulent. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're gonna be, we'll just discuss that in a, a show another day. <laughs> sure I'm sure will. we could talk about that for hours. Thank you so much, Ava and Freddie. They will yeah, be back yeah. with more papers in just under an hour. Now, you've been getting in touch with all your views and opinions. Many of you very angry about the rail strikes. Anthony says the unions destroyed Britain in the 1970s. And guess what? They're doing the same all over again. Robin says, I find it quite strange that people still believe unions can influence such a large number of workers again again and again for walkouts. If unions are to blame, then why is the state of our waterways, roads, councils and borders in such a state? They are not run by unions. Well, Oakley says, unions used to be entities that improved the working conditions of people. After all, it was people sticking together. Now it's purely politically motivated. What is ironic is that these striking workers cost billions with their walkouts and revenue, which sooner or later will be borne by taxpayers only. Yeah, um, lots of you getting in touch. You can do that by emailing us, talktoday at talk.tv. You can tweet us at talktv. You can also text us, text the word talk and your message to 8722. Let's move on now. Well, tonight is the London premiere of a highly anticipated Amy Winehouse biopic uh, that charts the late Grammy award-winning singer's meteoric rise to fame. And just like the singer's life, the film itself is not without its own controversy. Well, Back to Black has received criticism for exploiting Amy's life with social media even saying no, no, <laughs> no to actress Marissa Abella's voice performance, vocal performance. Let's do take a look. From primary school no, no, no. to sell out concerts. It's going to happen one of these days. A voice like yours, no, no, got to. No. It's one of the best I've ever heard. That's my daughter. That's my Amy. I met someone tonight. Stay lucky, Amy. Got a knife for the bad boys. Whoa, 
Well, we might have had a brief sneaky peek of our next guest now, Hannah Hope, just earlier <laughs> yes. when we were reading out text messages. Uh, <laughs> Hannah, you're showbiz editor of The Sun on Sunday. Thanks for joining us. What do you make of this trailer and its response on social media? Because it's caused so much controversy, hasn't it? It has. I think we've got to remember that this is a depiction of Amy Winehouse's life. So Marissa Abella, the actress playing Amy, isn't going to sound the same. She's not going to look the same. Yeah. This is her version. I mean, you've got to remember with all these biopics, the actors playing the star themselves never sound as good. I mean, Austin Butler, his version of, I don't know if you saw Elvis Presley, mm -hmm. I mean, his was nowhere near as good as Elvis's actual voice, but he still got nominated for an Oscar. So I think if you're going to go and watch the film, you've got to give it a chance. However, lots of people are saying it's too soon. It was only uh, 13 years ago that Amy passed away. And we still remember seeing her in the papers seeing her perform, there's so much coverage out there of mm, her. Mm. Just in terms of that, I mean, as you say, we, we don't know, we haven't seen it, but but I imagine that when you have immersion, you start to actually understand the characters. And, and it's not actually about replicating the vocal performance, no. is it? It's actually telling the story, how she was immensely uh, pressurised, I think, or in her own life, So she and we know she died of alcohol poisoning. Absolutely. I mean, either way, this film is going to be hugely controversial. There are going to be people who will just refuse to go and see it. They're going to want to boycott the film because mm. they think it's too soon. However, if you are going to give it a chance, um, Sam Taylor Woods, the producer, has said, look, she's tried to put it in Amy's words. They've read all of her, anything she's written, any, oh, they've read all her songs. They've watched extensive coverage of her interviews. They've really tried to show what Amy was going through, the love story between her and Blake Fielder Civil, her husband, What's also really interesting is Alison Owen is a producer on it. That is also Lily Allen's mother. So she knows herself what it's like to have mm, a daughter yeah. hugely in the public eye. Um, Amy's family were involved in the movie. They gave permission for the story to be told. They gave permission for it to be filmed in Amy's old flat in Camden. However, Sam Taylor Wood has said, look, I didn't ask permission for them to OK the script or anything. But I do think that unlike the 2015 documentary, Amy, where the family came across in a very harsh light indeed, I don't know if you saw that, yeah. mm. um, I think this is going to be more a celebration of her life. That's re it's really interesting. And I, I do understand the criticism from a lot of fans, actually, online. Uh, as a former actress, I completely understand that it's not about replicating the person entirely. It's about their essence and kind of getting across what they were about as a person. I'm going to show a little bit of a clip here now, because this is a clip that's courted the most, I think, criticism mm -hmm. on social is media. Is this what you showed me earlier? Yes, yeah. and then we will discuss. Let's have a look. Got your head so many lessons to learn. I say you don't know what love is. Get a grip. It's tricky, isn't it? Because sometimes it's, you know, you want to do a respectful respectful performance of a person. And then other times, like that clip, for example, it's a very short clip from a, you know, a two hour film maybe, but it feels like an impersonation of yeah. Amy. Yeah, I think you're right. It, it is Marissa's uh, impersonation of Amy, and I think it hits hard for those fans who uh, who are still feel it's quite raw. I mean, yeah. it was an incredibly sad tale. Everyone knows it only too well. And I think they're probably thinking, who's this fairly unknown actress? She's only really appeared in industry. I don't know if you saw it. It's an excellent yeah. BBC One drama. Um, and she is impersonating her. So it is going to hit hard. Yeah, I mean, I was just thinking back to things like Rocket Man, for example. And, and when I was watching Rocket Man, um, and I can't remember who plays the lead. Karen oh, yes, no, you see, I thought he was absolutely brilliant <laughs> yeah. because, and I suppose for me, he, he could sing brilliantly, it was well constructed, but also I started to believe he was Elton John. <laughs> mm. So, and, and that will be the measure of success, I think, if you can then immerse yourself and come out thinking, I have now experienced mm. her life. Yeah, absolutely. And I do think that what they want is for the, the, the makers of the film, they want you to kind of watch it, then just celebrate her music, come and put the music on. I mean, I know when yeah. I go and see these mm. biopics, often I do start listening to the music again. Yeah. Um, and I do think it will be box office success do because you? people will, will be so interested mm. to see what it's like and to relive this amazing, iconic British And do you star. think that's the point of the film, is, is that it's celebratory? Or is it kind of there as a warning to people about the kind of lifestyle that she led? 
I think they're, go they're going to be honest. They, they have said that they want it to be celebratory, but there's going to be some really hard-hitting scenes. We see her overdose in the London flat that where she's brought out on, on a stretcher by paramedics. Those paparazzi pictures actually were taken of them acting, so they were put side by side with the, right. the original ones. So I think it's going to be a hard watch. Difficult. I think they're going to be honest about her drug mm. addiction, um, but I hope it does celebrate Amy's life as well. well. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Hannah Hope from The Sun. Up next, Jim White is here with all your sports. I am indeed. Good morning, everybody. Yes, Jurgen Klopp says he will be rooting for arch rivals Manchester United as his title chasing side drop points with a draw at Old Trafford. And the Turkish Titans Fenerbahce field their youth team only to walk off two minutes into the Super Cup final with bitter rivals Galatasaray. What on earth was going on over there? And the veteran club manager Joe Kinnear has passed away at the age of 77. We'll look back at his incredible career. This is Talk Today. Good morning, everybody. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. The time is 7.50 now. Now, it was a dramatic day of football derbies yesterday with United versus Liverpool as well as the Old Firm derby in Glasgow. Both clashes ended in draws. Well, the Liverpool result leaves Arsenal at the top of the Premier League, though just one point separates the top three teams. Well, uh, we're joined now by TalkSport presenter Jim White, who has more on that and the string of results uh, last night. Jim, there were so many results, actually, right. just looking at the briefing sheet this morning. Yeah. Come on, you're very excited about the whole thing. Well, I mean, uh, where was I yesterday, David? I was at Wembley for the EFL trophy final between Ooh. Peterborough and Wickham. 
Uh, and that was their big day, 42,000 at that. I'll get to that shortly. So in the build-up to that game, I, I'm kind of tuning in on my phone, Manchester right. United, uh, <laughs> Liverpool, uh, Rangers, Celtic. I'll get to that in a second. Right. But Manchester United, Liverpool, I mean, 2-2, as you rightly say, ends in a draw. What did it boil down to? It boiled down to a lot of missed opportunities for Jurgen Klopp's Liverpool because uh, they battered Manchester United in the first half. 15 shots to United's none. But they couldn't capitalise on it. And in, in the second half, again, Liverpool looked to be cruising. Kwanzaa passed it across the field, the youngster, and uh, Bruno Fernandes knocked in at the back of the net. It was a brilliant goal. Um, but the, the upshot of all of that is that because it was a point apiece at Old Trafford, it very much puts Arsenal in the driving seat. It's back in their hands. If Arsenal win every game from this point onwards, and it's a big ask, and they right. know that, <laughs> then they win it. Right. So, I mean, it's advantage Arsenal now, but it's a great but title race. But the pressure on Arsenal then, the pressure builds, doesn't That's it? That's right. And of course, then, then they may not perform. No, exactly right. I mean, and there's a few more twists and turns to come yet. Yeah. Of that, there is no doubt. Are Arsenal due to play either United or Liverpool, or is that done now? Well, they've got Manchester United to play. They've got the likes of Aston Villa to play next. Right. So, I mean, every game is huge for them uh, in the running. But what they have done is given themselves a huge chance now. It's in their hands. Mm. If, they, if they win every game, then they win it, which is great. But not just two in this title race, David, three, which is great. With Manchester City, Liverpool... And, of course, Arsenal. Right. It could go right down to the last day. Right. So, I mean, you might have a helicopter going there with a the trophy <laughs> or there with a the trophy, whatever with the trophy. Um, um, Shall we move on and talk about Tottenham versus Nottingham Forest? Yeah, uh, Spurs now in the, the Champions League places. They won this game by three goals to one. Uh, everybody's a fan of Tottenham because of the way they play under Ange Postacoglu. Their attitude is pretty brilliant. You score two, we'll get three. You score <laughs> three, we'll get four. I like the way they, they do it under this, the former Celtic manager. Um, now they go above Villa on goal difference but they've got a game in hand. So Tottenham looking very strong. And uh, on the run-in, we've got the North London derby because Tottenham yet to meet Arsenal as well. So that could be pretty interesting on the run-in. Elsewhere, Sheffield United got uh, a draw. Sheffield United absolutely fighting for their lives, uh, trying to survive in the Premier League. It's an uphill struggle for them. I think they'd admit that. And a stroppy manager from Chelsea, was this right? Something keep, Did he not complain about the boys not being strong enough or something? Yeah, yeah, Mauricio Pochettino at the end of it. I mean, one would have thought that Chelsea would go to Bramall Lane and win, but they didn't. Uh, two all draw and Pochettino said uh, at the end of it that his his boys it's a young team but they weren't mature enough uh, to win at Sheffield United uh, that's a bit damning isn't it it's Not a bit mature, damning yeah. yeah yeah I like Mauricio Pochettino I've known him a long time he says problems need to be addressed in the summer so you have to think that's a kind of uh, pointed shot at the uh, people at the top of Chelsea maybe to get some mm. more deals done but this is a Chelsea ownership the US ownership who have come in uh, and spent a billion already so I I mean, they, wow. it's not as if they haven't put their hands in their pockets. They sure. absolutely have. Uh, but they might have to do it a bit more if Chelsea are to start going up that table. They're unrecognisable in the middle of the table. Chelsea mm. should never be there. <laughs> not, not, not in our thoughts. Well, I want to move on now to the Turkish football drama. Can you just lay out what happened over the weekend? Well, this was all very strange. I mean, Turkish football at the best of times is a powder keg. I've been out there. I actually went to Fenerbahce Galatasaray once and you, you, you feel the tension uh, from start to finish. These two do not like each other. But this goes back to a game in recent weeks when uh, Fenerbahce were involved in a game against uh, Trabzonspor. And at the end of that game, right. uh, a number of Trabzonspor fans came on and the Fenerbahce players ended up swapping blows with some of the fans from Trabzonspor what? on mm -hmm. the field of play. So Fenerbahce, one of the giants in Turkish football, have been at loggerheads with the Turkish authorities, uh, wanting them to act in the interest of player safety, of course. And they say that the Turkish authorities have been dragging their feet. Mm. So this was the Super cu uh, Cup final between Fenerbahce and Galatasaray. For a start, they fielded a youth team. And then two minutes into it, David, they decided to walk off. Oh, wow. Goodness. So, of course, Tempest the Super Cup really was awarded to Galatasaray and Fenerbahce were like two fingers to the authorities. How would you like that? <laughs> <laughs> Shall we finally finish on Joe Kinnear, the former Wimbledon and Newcastle? Manager, this yeah. is in the headlines uh, this morning. Yes, um, he's a man I met in my time in London on a number of occasions. He was absolutely steeped in football. Uh, Joe Kinnear, one time Wimbledon, one time Luton, one time Forest, one time Newcastle United manager. 
And uh, it's always sad when we hear about it. Mm. But died age 77, dementia. Oh, how very sad. Uh, sad. It's very, very sad indeed, David. And so many uh, names in football these days, when Mm. they go, the word dementia Mm. seems to follow. Uh, So sad, he he contributed hugely. A great contributor to the game here in England, Joe Kinnear, who Mm. died at the age Mm. of 77. Missed by many. Well, thank you so much, Jim, for taking us through the sport this morning. Still to come on the show, what is next in Israel's war in Gaza? It's now more than six months old and the violence continues. We'll ask Tobias Elwood whether a breakthrough could be imminent. This is Talk Today. The time is 7.56. Good morning. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Isn't Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <Where is> it? <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, it put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t- when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. We're supposed to, fail her. We're supposed to move on from era. that. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with David Bull and Nicola Thorpe. Good morning to you. It's 8 o'clock on Monday, the 8th of April. Yeah, we talk today on TV, radio, online, and, of course, on your smart speaker. Our top stories this morning. Israeli troops are withdrawn from southern Gaza, raising fears over where they might target next. Lord Cameron sends a clear message to the Israeli Prime Minister. We'll speak to Conservative MP Tobias Elwood about what happens next. Angela Rayner's tax round deepens. Labour's deputy leader faces allegations she registered the wrong property as her main home. Tony Blair's former advisor shares his insight. And rail strikes woes continue. Members of Aslef walk out this morning causing chaos to commuters. We're live from the picket line this hour.
And wow, it was a warm but wet and windy weekend and it doesn't look much uh, like anything different for this week either. Continue unsettled. I have the details for you in the forecast later. Ah, oh, what joy. Thanks ever so much, Naz. Uh, now, though, it's time for the headlines with Emily. Thank you, David. Good morning. Israel has withdrawn almost all its troops from southern Gaza, leading to hopes that more humanitarian aid can safely reach civilians. Officials believe the IDF has reduced its number of troops in the region so it can regroup before targeting Rafah, where hundreds of thousands are sheltering. Well, yesterday, the British Foreign Secretary Lord Cameron said UK support for Israel is not unconditional after an Israeli attack on an aid convoy that left seven people dead. Well, the editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post, Speaker Kleins, told Talk Today he believes a ceasefire isn't an option right now. We all have our red lines, 100%. I think if, if the only issue is, 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 is accidentally in, in a terrible situation, killing you know, uh, volunteers from around the world, bringing food in a, in a war zone, in a mistaken situation, that is not a reason to cause a ceasefire. And again, we're talking about a terrorist organization the UN's atomic watchdog has warned a new drone attack on Ukraine's Zaporizhia power plant raises the risk of a major nuclear accident. Russia's Nuclear Power Corporation has accused Ukraine's military of carrying out the strikes, but Ukraine denies involvement. Three people were injured. The plant's Russian-installed administration said radiation levels were normal and that there's no serious damage. Here and a major manhunt continues after a 27-year-old mum was stabbed and killed while pushing her baby in a pram in Bradford. Police say Habiba Masum is wanted over the attack and that he's known to the victim, but they won't confirm how. Well, former Detective Superintendent Shabnam Chowdhury is told Talk Today there will be great urgency to track him down. One day may not seem a lot of time to many people, but in the life of a murder investigation, that's a significant amount of loss of evidence and the golden hours, which are really crucial at this time. The police will be looking at CCTV, any digital footprint that he may have left behind in terms of where he's gone. And right now, there's major disruption across the rail network, with train drivers walking off the job in their third day of major strike action over pay and working conditions. Staff at 16 train companies are taking part, causing cancellations, delays or no services at all to some areas. You're up to date. I'll have more headlines in an hour. Thanks, Emily. Well, on to our top story today. Israel's defence minister says that troops have been withdrawn from southern Gaza, raising fears that their next target could be Rafa. Now, the news comes as the Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, says Britain's support for Israel is not unconditional following the killing of seven aid workers. Well, joining us now to discuss this are Israeli columnist Gershon Baskin and the former chair of the Defence Select Committee, Tobias Elwood. Good morning, both. Uh, we're going to start with you, Tobias. What do you think this means for the Israeli war effort and their goal of eradicating Hamas? Well, maybe let's start with that war effort, because six months on... And this is an ally we're talking about, that we want to see defeat Hamas. But six months on, this has clearly been a messy, clumsy invasion without an obvious objective, a strategy to get you there. So how is the Israelis' military action, its superior military might, leading to any form of success? I don't know what that is. And we've seen this conflict escalate beyond Gaza uh, and Israel. And of course, the scale of collateral damage has been huge not least to even British citizens being killed. And when Britain has to resort to using the Royal Navy to get in a maritime uh, corridor to get aid in, and indeed do airdrops as well, something has gone very, very wrong indeed. And these are the questions that David Cameron, the Foreign Secretary, is wanting to ask, because uh, the Eras crossing, for example, which is in the, the north, the major crossing uh, in the north of Gaza, has been closed this entire time, right next to Gaza City. And uh, that should not have uh, that should not have been close. Neither should that huge maritime port that um, that uh, Israel has, that uh, the container port. No uh, humanitarian aid has come through there. That has now changed because of pressure by uh, the West. But we're in a very difficult situation here. We must abide by international law. So if it's proved that uh, uh, Israel is breaching humanitarian law, then we have no cho choice but to freeze. Um, our arms exports. But that is for the SCDO number 10 to make that judgment. 
Uh, and Tobias, just on, on that, of course, uh, just, we're hearing different kind of rhetoric now from the Prime Minister. He says the nation remains appalled. He wants a humanitarian pause immediately, leading to a long-term sustainable ceasefire. You mentioned uh, the Royal Navy there also going in. We've pledged another £9.7 million in aid to Gaza, trying to establish that humanitarian corridor between Cyprus and with Gaza as well. Netanyahu is looking increasingly isolated on the world stage. We've got this evidence possibly that Alicia Keynes has talked about, about whether Israel has breached humanitarian law pressure, as you rightly say, coming from the United Kingdom and the United States. And uh, the other point that you made, which was a very good one, which is about how this is escalating. And now you've got Iran actually vowing revenge against Israel after those Israeli attacks on Iran's consulate in Syria. So how does this play out when you've also got people in Israel protesting, saying Netanyahu does not represent us? Yes, I think this is the point that I alluded to, but you put your finger on it. This is all about Prime Minister Netanyahu trying to save his job, I think. You know, he made this big promise. His uh, whole purpose, if you like, of the last couple of decades was to say, support me, let me lead Israel, and you will be safe. Now, that all came crashing down on the 7th of October, and he's wanted to show some form of response. But we haven't thought through exactly what that response should be and where it goes. The difficulty is that we require the cooperation of Israel to get aid into Gaza. At the moment, it's about uh, over just over 100 lorries a day. It should be 500. We need Israel's uh, support for that. Otherwise, famine will break out. We need Israel's cooperation to prevent this escalating further and ultimately to participate in two state, state uh, talks. So the question is, if we actually did impose um, uh, some form of sanctions or freeze our arms sales, would we yield later a greater influence or not? And that is the concern we have separate as to whether international law has been breached or not. Very, very difficult questions requiring a lot of statecraft at this moment. And just bringing in Gershon, Gershon Baskin, uh, a hostage negotiator, not a columnist, as we accidentally said earlier. Uh, we know there was a recovery of the body of an Israeli hostage, Elad Katzir, uh, over the weekend. He was recovered on Saturday. His sister actually blamed the Israeli authorities over her brother's death in a post on social media, saying that he actually would have returned alive if Israel had agreed to a new truce deal. What do you make of that, Gershon? Well, I think uh, it's true. I mean, I've been saying since the very first week of the war that every day that the hostages remain in Gaza is a danger to their lives, whether they're killed by Israeli bombing or by ex being executed by Hamas. Uh, we're now on day 185. We passed the six month mark. There are now 133 hostages left in Gaza. There's a dispute on how many of them are alive, but it's assumed that probably less than half of them are alive today, and everything must be done to bring them home. There are negotiations ongoing. There were the highest level negotiations taking place yesterday in Cairo because President Biden applied extreme pressure on Mr. Netanyahu and sent the head of the CIA to Cairo, uh, where he met the head of the Mossad and the head of Egyptian uh, Central Intelligence and the Qatari Prime Minister. Now the sides are going back home to their capitals for consultations. The Hamas are holding their internal con uh, consultations, and I hope that we will see progress. There is increased aid going into Gaza now. Yesterday, there were more than 300 lorries that entered Gaza. I think that the Israelis have understood that this is an issue that they need to remove from the agenda. And my understanding is that the Israelis intend to flood Gaza with humanitarian aid, and that should have been done a long time ago. But if it's done now, that's a good thing. We also have a target date right in front of us. We're at the end of the holy month of Ramadan, and there's a four-day um, Eid al-Fitr holiday, which might be a good time for the sides to have a ceasefire to cool off. The Israeli withdrawal from southern Gaza might facilitate that ceasefire, and if it's part of the negotiations, that would be a very good sign. Uh, Tobias, this all revolves around the geopolitics. It's an incredibly complex situation. We also have Israel and Hamas at loggerheads over what the outcome or the solution might be. We've got these ceasefire talks taking place with the US, the Qataris, Egypt, Israel and Hamas. But they're poles apart. If we're talking about a two-state solution, which you and I have discussed a great deal, 
Israel doesn't want that, according to Netanyahu. Hamas doesn't want that. How do you square that circle? Well, exactly. If Netanyahu doesn't want it, is he the right person to be leading Israel? That is a question for the Israeli people. But Israel as a whole, their position has been for decades, uh, and I know this because I was the Middle East uh, minister for a number of years, has been publicly to say, yes, we will pursue a two-state solution, but we require peace from uh, Gaza. And the challenge has been, well, Hamas is in charge, and we can't now work with Hamas. Uh, and I understand that. We all understand that after what happened after the 7th of October. So the question is, who can you work with? What will be the governance and security structure for Gaza, which will uh, assure Israel that this won't be repeated? And that's the difficulties that we face. I would say because of the, the manner in which uh, uh, Israel has gone about uh, this uh, attack, he's, they've actually allowed uh, Hamas to develop in its recruitment because so many uh, normal Gazans have said, I'm fed up with this, I'm going to join and I'm going to fight. So you need to recognize this bigger picture here. There's no doubt Israeli's behavior must change. Six months on, this conflict continues to escalate, as you implied, and the West's patience is starting to ebb away with no obvious strategy that sits behind what Prime Minister Netanyahu is trying to achieve. And of course, this behaviour only strengthens radicalisation. I want to bring it home, if I can, to exactly. bias. This poll yeah. over the weekend by the Henry Jackson Society of UK Muslims, Muslims in this country, one in four British Muslims believe that Hamas, only one in four, 25%, uh, only 25% believe that Hamas committed murder and rape. 46% of British Muslims said they sympathise with Hamas. When you look at the numbers and you break it down, they're most likely to be younger and well-educated UK Muslims. That shows, according to Alan Mendoza, the executive uh, director of uh, the Henry Jackson Society, that actually we have failed in this country in terms of counter-extremism policy. Uh, we are failing, there's no doubt about that. And you take that a step forward and you end up with homegrown radicalisation because if people do have a distorted view of what is going on. It's very easy then to recruit them to do something more sinister. And that is a concern that we have. MI6 have, have made that very, very clear, as has the government as well. There's also a responsibility, if I may humbly say this, to the Muslim community to be able to spell out the differences between Hamas and the Palestinian authorities, Fatah, to be distinguished between uh, what Hamas uh, has done in the past uh, and therefore put it into clarity as to why Israel responded in the way that it's done. If you don't have that detail, then yes, you're going to end up, and we've seen it on the streets of London and elsewhere as well, with banners actually supporting Hamas as well. There's an absolute um, uh, imperative to educate everybody, all of Britain, but including those in the Muslim community. And it is then a question as to where their news source is actually coming from in today's day and age, where you can be very selective in what messaging you actually want to hear. That's the concern that we need to address. It's interesting, isn't it, Tobias? Because it says on that strap there, 47% uh, of 18 to 24-year-olds don't think terrorist group committed atrocities. What's not clear is whether or not they think that what happened was atrocious or whether it didn't happen in the first place and they believe it's some kind of, you know, social media or, or media conspiracy. Yes, that's exactly it. And it is that messaging that is so critical. It's important to, be able to, to discuss this. There was a question that came up, I think, a couple of weeks ago as to whether in the classrooms uh, teachers were allowed to discuss this. And I think the answer was, no, we're not going to go mm. near it. Well, mm. my argument would be, yes, you must actually debate and discuss uh, these difficult issues. That's the time to start learning about the world around you, but learning from an objective perspective, not a subjective perspective. Yeah. Let's bring in Gersh uh, Gershon just finally, if I may. So in terms of where we are, you mentioned we think about 130 hostages are still held. We believe 34 of those may well be dead. We've heard the figures from Hamas of 33,000 deaths in Gaza, 75,000 injured. How do you see this playing out? Because when you look at Hamas's demands and the demands of Israel, they are polar opposites. Israel says it will not agree to a ceasefire until the hostages are released. Now, when you look at what Hamas is saying, they're saying we need a permanent uh, ceasefire before we even consider releasing those hostages. How does this actually play out? 
I think it's really important to understand that the public statements made are part of the negotiation and not necessarily a reflection of what's going on in the negotiations themselves. I think it is essential, as Mr. Elwood said, that there be a political end game to this war, which is absent. The political end game must be that we have to know who the keys are going to be turned over into Gaza if we want to eliminate Hamas. And the biggest enemy of Hamas is advancing the two-state solution. So if the UK wants to be part of the uh, victory for uh, the two-state solution, it is time for the UK to also recognize the state of Palestine. 30 years, not only has Israel and others talked about the two-state solution, but so has the United Kingdom. And it's time to recognize the other of the two states in order to make it real. And this will put us on the path to defeating Hamas ideologically and politically, and it's essential. The UK has historic responsibility here, and I think there's nothing wrong with the UK taking the lead on it, even ahead of the United States. The U.S. will follow. Others will follow. It's time to take that first crucial step to make the two-state solution real. Well, thank you so much. Uh, hostage negotiator Gershon Baskin and Conservative MP Tobias Elwood. They're two fascinating guests. Thank you for joining us. Let's take a look at some of this morning's front pages now. The Telegraph focuses on Lord Cameron's warning to the U.S. over blocking aid to Ukraine, claiming that they're risking the security of the West. Uh, the Times leads on the rise of the 24-hour wait for a bed in A&E as more than 150,000 patients waited more than a day for a hospital bed last year. And the Mail say, Rainer's making a fool of you, Keir, as the Labour leader faces criticism for his unwillingness to probe claims against his deputy's property dealings. And sticking with that Angela Rayner story now, as Labour's deputy leader's tax affairs were in the spotlight for most of the weekend following those claims about a second home. Well, Shadow Foreign Secretary David Lammy has now jumped to Rayner's defence, claiming that it's all a smear that's designed to distract from the Tory chaos. Well, joining us now is former advisor to Tony Blair, John McTurnan. And, and John, we've been speaking about this, I think we spoke about it actually at the end of last week as well. Uh, in terms of Angela Rayner here, this story just doesn't seem to want to go away. All, it all revolves around what was right, which was her primary residence. Did she do anything wrong? Did she benefit from not uh, paying that capital gains tax? Did she actually get a single person discount from the council tax? Why doesn't she just put this to bed? Which is what James said right at the beginning. Just show us the advice that you got and it will all go away if it's true. Well, she's not done anything wrong. Well, you say that. How do we know that? Well, I know her and she's done that. That doesn't mean she you know she that. hasn't done anything wrong. She's having smear after smear in the papers and she is correctly just ignoring them. John, John, she said her primary residence was in Vicarage Road, so she bought that property. At the same time, her husband and children seem to be living somewhere else. She posts on social media, I'm now home, which is at the husband's house, and all her soft furnishings and things like beds are in the husband's home. Now, they can't be in both homes. Do you know how capital gains tax works? Yes. What do you want to explain to the viewers? Well, so in terms of your primary residence, you don't pay capital gains, but on a secondary property, you would have to pay capital gains. So if that, so the question revolves around, is that her primary residence or not? It's a question for the tax authorities. She designates a primary residence, and that's a question for the tax authorities. You may dislike the fact that your, that your primary residence is different in tax terms from what your home is, but that's the way the tax law works. So, John, if she, as uh, Angela claims, was given this advice to say that she's done nothing wrong, why hasn't she published it to just make this story go away? Well, I agree, I agree with what Angie said. Uh, she said, um, show me yours, I'll show you mine. And that's directed towards...? Tory MPs, right. journalists, whoever wants to go on and on about this non-story, she's saying, you publish before I'll publish. I think that's fair enough. She's being harassed about this. It's a straightforward issue. It's a straightforward issue about the way taxation works. There's deliberate um, attacks. It's, the it's not the Daily Mail who's saying anything. It's um, the the, um, the current, uh, maybe soon to resign, who knows, because uh, so, they, they, they move so fast through the post, the current Tory party chair, uh, Richard Holden. Um, of course, he's writing uh, letters to Keir Starmer, and I presume Keir Starmer's done the right thing, which is throw it straight in the bin. So, doesn't this smack of hypocrisy? Because why? Angela... Re well, I'll tell you why. Because Angela Rayner called for Akshata Murthy to reveal her tax affairs. Now, you can't have it both ways. You can't say, you have to show us your tax affairs. Oh, by the way, I'm not going to show you mine. So, we've got a Prime Minister 
who, until it was revealed in public, had a green card. The Prime Minister of the United Kingdom wanted to go and live and work in the US. And we and, have now a and, Deputy and Prime his, Minister in his, waiting who his, may well have broken the law. A, no, she's not broken the law. She may well have done. No, she may not have broken the law. That's just a nonsense. It's just like the Tory party have nothing to say about the country, nothing to say about the future of the country. They fear Angela Rayner. She's a great campaigner. She cuts through, she makes connections. And it's just like they're trying to make a mountain out of a molehill. Can both of those things be true, though? Both of which can it be, be true. that, yes, the Tories, we can understand tactically why they would want to make a mountain out of a molehill, but could it also be that there is a molehill to look at at the same time? There is capital gains tax, and it operates in a way, and Angela Rayner, for her tax affairs, complied with capital gains tax. And that's a matter for HMRC. It's not for me or for you to debate it. Angela's had advice. She's very clear about it on the record. Um, and the Tories would rather we talked about this than we talked about almost any other issue facing the country. Do you think she'll survive this? Of course she will. Can we bet on it? Yeah, 100 quid. <laughs> okay. well, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> You're paid more <laughs> than I. Um, but, but Is that just, taxable? Just, yeah, right. just, I don't know about Just bet, moving on. Can I, I, think, I just... I think betting games aren't taxable. Can, can, no. I don't think they are, actually. No, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. Um, That's another debate. We're always that talking is another about debate. Yeah, we're always um, talking about tax. But obviously we have more rail strikes yeah. taking place and now. It does seem mm. that every service is yeah. striking. Yeah. Um, so the RMT have settled. I think it was four yep. percent and five percent. Yes, uh, the offer on uh, for uh, Aslef is four plus four. Oh, yeah. um, they're not settling. What would Labour do if it got into power? Would the strikes all stop? And if so, how? Well, as Mick Whelan, the um, general secretary of Aslef, always says, this is not a debate, a dispute with government. It's a dispute with private companies. It's a matter for the companies to settle us. But also, in terms of the system, it is very odd that it seems the government seems to act as the go-between between, between a private sector company and then... Oh, the go the there's no, yeah, no there's, no, there's no doubt in my mind that the government are leaning on railway companies not to settle us. Do you think? Um, why, why does it suit the government? Uh, because the government, the government want to have uh, a dispute with, union, uh, with unions. They can say, look, that's the future of the country under Labour. There's a dispute between private companies and, and trade unions. The, the big dispute at the moment uh, that the government won't deal with is the junior, is the junior doctors. Now, that, that should be dealt with by the pay review body. Labour in government will allow unions in private sector companies to negotiate with employers, and where it comes to public servants, that will be dealt with by pay review bodies. But it's not a matter of, for the government to get involved. In terms of the PR spin, doesn't yeah. that offset the dissatisfaction that voters will have with the fact that they can't actually get on a train today? Yeah, no, but most people in Britain don't travel on trains. Interesting. But isn't, but isn't that the problem? Because we're subsidising them enormous amounts of money and, well, we and the system doesn't work. Well, we, su we, we subsidise them for, 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 for pretty good reasons, which is that actually it's a major contribution to tackling climate change uh, and to, to, re to get to our net zero targets. But like one in two people in the country only do one or two rail journeys a year. So but is that because it's... the service has been so dreadful you can't rely on it? No, so we heard from people no, who it's, it's, focused, it's focused on work. It's focused on working people and commuting mainly. That's and it does a good job in London. It does a great job in Manchester. It does a great job uh, in Merseyside, where the, the mayor there runs a great Mersey Rail. Look, um, this is a dispute between unions and employers. And I believe the employers have been lent on by the government because the government do not want to see uh, a pay deal that could settle the dispute. And do you think, sorry, very quickly, if I can, when Labour, if Labour gets in, will all the strikes stop? Will you settle the junior doctor strike? All the strikes will stop when Labour comes in. The sun will shine every day. There'll be growth. <laughs> uh, we'll solve the housing crisis. It will be paradise. Really? <laughs> Sounds wonderful. Certainly we don't have time to discuss that in greater <laughs> detail. Uh, John McTurnan, former advisor to Tony Blair there. We're still to come on Talk Today. Over 150,000 patients waited more than 24 hours in A&E before getting a hospital bed last year. And forget tough love, the health secretary says parents must give children hugs and it doesn't make them too clingy. Well, the spectators, Freddie Gray and Ava Santina from Politics. Joe, take us through the papers. That's next. Do stay with us. The time, 8.25. <laughs>Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker.
Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to you Talk Today. It is 8.28. We'll have the weather in just a moment. But here's what else is coming up in the programme. Paganism is the fastest growing religion in the military, with numbers rising almost 150% from 2020. We'll have more on that in the papers. That's next. Wow, we'll strike three as ASLEF members walk out and cause chaos for commuters this morning. At 8.40, our correspondent Nick Ellaby will be live at a picket line with General, uh, Secretary General Mick Whelan. And after former British paratrooper Daniel Berg was killed in Ukraine, his father has been fighting for answers and justice. And he joins us live in the studio before nine. But first, here is Naz with the weather. What's happening, Naz? Um, not much of a change, really, if I'm honest with you. We are going to continue with the unsettled conditions. It was a wet and windy weekend, thanks to Storm Kathleen. It was also very warm. We saw temperatures peak over 20 degrees Celsius for the first time this year. It won't be as mild for most of this week, but it definitely will be wet and windy still. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning. So, as I said, it was a warm weekend, but it was a wet and windy one as well. Now, the next few days, we will see temperatures return to around average for the time of year, but we'll continue with low-pressure systems coming through with wet and windy conditions. Several warnings are in force from the Met Office already over the next 48 hours. But then as we head into the weekend, high pressure starts to build from the south, so we'll see more of a north-south divide with southern areas seeing the driest, brightest conditions and becoming warmer once again. But the north will stay quite unsettled. Not so this morning, though. It's the 
south, seeing the unsettled weather across northern and western parts of England and Wales, cloudy without breaks of showery rain. Whereas for Scotland and Northern Ireland, the sunny start to the day and mainly dry but chilly and bright as well for eastern parts of England. Now through the day, we'll see that wet weather move its way further northwards. In fact, it's a name storm by Meteo France and it is going to bring rather strong winds later. But lots of sunshine to be had for uh, central northern parts of Scotland uh, this afternoon. Northern Ireland will become wetter as will southern Scotland though. And for Wales and down towards many southwestern parts of England, there will be showery spells of rain. And in fact, later there will be some heavy and thundery showers spreading northwards across some uh, southern counties towards the southeast. It will still be fairly mild though, temperatures up to 17 degrees Celsius. Now overnight, we'll continue to see that rain and move its way further northwards. Winds will be rather strong, particularly down towards parts of southwest where there is a warning from the Met Office. And there's also a warning that will be enforced for southern and eastern parts of Scotland tonight as rain falls on already saturated ground. There could be some flooding issues. If you're hoping to glimpse the partial eclipse, then uh, this evening around 7.55pm is when we're likely to see that. And that's most likely across the far north of Scotland where the clearest skies are likely for this evening. Everywhere else will be quite cloudy. Now, overnight and um, into tomorrow, we'll see that low move off into the North Sea, but it will still bring rain and cloudy skies for the north and east of Scotland. Showers out towards the west, so brighter there in between. Sunshine showers for Northern Ireland, Wales and southern and western parts of England, but eastern England and northern England will be rather cloudy with showery rain. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Thanks very much indeed, Naz. Now let's have a final look through the papers with Ava Santina from Politics Joe and the spectators, Freddie. Great. Freddie, let's, um, it would be remiss if we didn't discuss this big headline in The Times this morning, rise of the 24-hour wait for a bed in A&E. Yes, if you need a hospital bed, if you turn up at A&E and you need a hospital bed, you don't want to be waiting 24 hours to get it, and yet a large number of people are. Uh, there was actually a massive increase in the last lot of figures, but it's still going up. It's up 17% on, mm. on last year, and that's more than 150,000 people. These tend to be old people with multiple of problems who uh, desperately need to lie down and mm. just can't. So you're often hearing, well, hearing reports, reading reports about people in, you know, just lying down in corridors and so on mm. in hospital beds in a Britain where the NHS is supposed to be, uh, you know, a very highly functional health service, and it's clearly not on this front. No, it's not. It's not at all. I, I speak about it all the time. Uh, the fact is, do you know how many beds we have in this country? Just roughly. Oh, no. Shall, it, shall I go for a guess? Yeah, go for a guess. I'm going to go 90,000. 140,000. We used bad, to have, oh, but we sorry. used to have 300,000. The issue is that, I mean, this is a major problem, and uh, it will be a problem for West Streeting if he gets in because. Mm -hmm. And he has spoken about this, about we need to ra massively reform the system. You can't keep chucking money at it. It doesn't work. Mm. Well, no, absolutely. And he's writing, he's written actually in The Sun today about how he's not going to give the NHS any more money. And this is part of his plan to sort of introduce a Blair-style PFI system where you'll be uh, handed... Yeah, yeah, your face but you, is well, not... Well, my face is, is that like that because we're still paying for those hospitals. Yeah. It was a terrible idea to do mm. PFI. It didn't work. And PFI with, standing for...? Uh, private Finance Initiative. And that's how they, they financed all of those hospitals. And it doesn't work. Yes, and so, and so he's saying no more money for the NHS apart from um, money will be reallocated. So if you can't get an appointment, say, for a hip replacement, that will be given over to the private sector and that will clear the backlog. But, you know, where this money is going to come from if you're not going to allocate any more, I mean, th that's the real question, isn't it? It because is. Sure. Well, let's move on to a health-related story, Freddie, because apparently you should hug your children. Yes. Um, uh, Victoria Atkins is saying that there's a health benefit to that. Yeah, uh, this story alarmed me because I don't hug my children. Why oh, not? Why not? No, <laughs> okay. no, no, you do. You do. I, I, mean, no, I try not to, but sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you can't get out of it. Are you, are you one of those dads who loves a hug or are you like a sort of hug like at arm's length? I don't know. I mean, I suppose sometimes it's all right. Yeah. <laughs> Depends which child at which, char at which oh, time. At which time, time yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, but yes, apparently it's Victoria Atkins, our health yeah. secretary, is saying that she's going against the trend there's a new trend for uh, more distancing between parents and children because of coddling and so on, which I do think is a concern. You know, there's a concern, but actually, Victoria Atkins is talking about babies and sort of skin contact time. But the move, the, the, the sort of mood music with older children now is less contact could be good because of coddling and the mental health impacts of coddling. So totally a lot of ridiculous. a lot of children yeah. are more anxious because of coddling. Victoria is that saying that. Not also because we're seeing a generation of young toddlers now who were brought up during COVID. 
yeah. and perhaps they're very, very clingy with their parents because they were the only adults that they've known. Yes. And, I mean, they need to be... Uh, children need to learn how to be without their parents. It's a very sure. important thing. And if you, the more you delay that, the more dramatic... That's why I came back to work after nine weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. to teach go. her a lesson. So yeah. it a bit harsh, Ava, doesn't it? Don't, I mean, everyone loves a cuddle. Well, I don't know. I'm barren. I'm not the right person to ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks very much for that, for that insight. Spinster. <laughs> what, what, what do you think? I mean, obviously, you've got... Yeah, a, a, I've got a, a little new, baby. You've got a little I've one. got a newborn, so I, d I don't know how much damage I've done to her just yet. But I think she's that... She's very good, though. She's very... Yes, she David met her on, on Friday she's night. very beautiful. At the pub. We tried to... Oh, from the outset, we've tried to socialise her as much as possible. Um, so make sure that we pass her around so that she gets hugs, not just from mm. us, but from everybody else, so that she doesn't, you know, whinge when we're not there. Etc. But yeah, I think we definitely don't need tough love on children. But I completely understand that if a child is only happy when they're attached to the parent, then yeah. that's not a good thing for them either. Well, and bedtime too. So if you've got a child that repeatedly comes into your bed, mm. you know, I think it's important to kick them out. Oh no, I'm not. Yes, it yeah. is. It's about I'll boundaries. It's a like nanny out. state, though, isn't it? That the health minister has to tell a us bit, that we yeah. should hug our children. Yes, I, I mean, agree you know, with that. You hug our children. Yeah. <laughs> um, like, let, let Ava, let, can we move on to the front page of the Telegraph? This is a shocking story, if you ask me. Gen Z. They say it's okay to put the el your elbows on the table. Well, oh, yeah. do you know, I actually think this might be... I, I think it's being billed by The Telegraph as, you know, the, the loss of all table manners, but perhaps it's just a change in standards or an a, adaptation. So, so one of the stats that they were particularly upset about was apparently 38% of Gen Zers have no qualms about eating off each other's plates. Now, that sounds disgusting, but... When you think about the, the way that, you know, when you go into a restaurant now, most restaurants are small plates. Mm. You're sharing food all it's the time. It's very European. Yes. Tapas so, vibes. Yes, yes. So it's very European to do that. And so perhaps it's not, you know, it's, it's a bit uncouth maybe to just sort of eat off someone else's plate. But if we're talking about a sharing, you know, a sharing platter, yeah. I'm going to strongly right. disagree about this. I think it, I think this Telegraph story is onto something here because I, I do think Gen Z's table manners are terrible. What it, kind? It, using the phone a lot while eating. Terrible. Uh, at the family table, or just socially, I think that's terrible, really bad form. Mm. Um, elbows, I'm not so fussed about. Also, I think you can put your elbows on the table as long as you do both at the same time. No, right? you can't. No, no. I think you have to put your elbow. Your elbows have to be off the table. You can rest your arms at all times. I believe so. What, okay. what about what about when you're you're ordering or when you're looking? I don't know. When you're at the beginning, oh, and you, you've just mm. sat down and you're you're speaking to your you know to your partner or whatever. You've just sat down and you're having a conversation. What if you're sitting like that? What do we think? Yeah, good point. Is that no, bad? We get told off for doing that too much on this show as well. <laughs> yeah, you do. Don't bang the desk. Yes. Um, uh, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? But I do think that in terms of um, manners, <laughs> we are losing we are losing manners in this country. Mm. Well, what do you think? I, yeah, uh, yes, I would say so. I think also, particularly... If, I mean, I'm sorry to bang on always about mobile phones, but they are quite important in everyone's lives. Uh, and I think phones mean people are losing management. Quite often yeah. you, you talk Great. to someone and they'll start going on their I phone. agree. I'm, and using the speaker instead of listening to yes. stuff in headphones. I'm yes. really hard line yeah. on that. I yeah. think it's OK if you're during the working day. I think if you're at work and you go to a working lunch, yeah. I think that's OK to have your phone on the sure. table. Sure, I get that. But if you're going to see friends, I can't think of anything worse than someone... Just... Yeah, and also, okay. I'm, I, I would say if someone started texting in front of me, I'd be like, am I wasting <laughs> your time? No, no, no. no. Not for me. Uh, Give my manners, I'm going to sneeze. Oh, right. Whilst you do that, <laughs> shall we move on, Freddie, and talk about paganism? This is an extraordinary headline. Paganism is the fastest growing religious group in the military. In the military, yes, this is extraordinary. Uh, and it's, um, well, it's, I mean, it's from 270 to 660, which is not uh, loads, but it's still quite a significant mm. growth. And I wonder what this could be about. I think paganism is becoming more popular generally, and uh, pagans quite like fighting. Oh, do they? Yeah, oh. so that's why they're going to the military. I don't understand a lot about that. They don't have Christian concepts of forgiveness and love and tenderness. That's why. <laughs> I'm sure they do as yeah. human beings. Well, they have well, a concept I would like of, to say. of tenderness. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Right, Ava, we're going to move on to this story now because I know you're really keen to talk about Finally. it. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> this is the story of the day. So there's this love coach. He's called Albert. Now, you wouldn't think that was traditionally a name associated <laughs> with a Lothario, but this man is teaching men how to cheat and how to cheat no. effectively. Right. You know, it's good for men, apparently, to cheat. Now, he's put out a list. If he's doing any of these things, ladies, he's cheating. For example, if you find new clothes in a rucksack, 
he's cheating. No way. If he's going to the gym, he's cheating. <laughs> and if he started doing more housework, he is che cheating. And the best one, actually, is he's never available at lunchtime. <laughs> this is misandry, so surely. He, he might possibly be following your advice, which is don't use your phone at lunch. Yeah. And now you think he's gone missing. And, he, you know, well, or is he cheating? Can't a more... man wash his underwear without being accused of having an affair? Well, the yeah. more housework exactly. one is, is damned if you do, damned if you don't. Yes. It? I mean, so if, you, if you're helping with the dishes, <laughs> that means you're a cheat. <laughs> well, yeah. potentially. Yeah. Yeah. So also there was another story saying that if your partner, your male partner is losing weight, they're cheating. Mm. New aftershave. They're cheating. Yes, absolutely. This is this is, this is the same story. These yeah. are all of the tips. And also, if you're <laughs> if you're fighting less and having more sex, he's cheating. Also, this guy Albert says that he's had <laughs> over a hundred affairs. It's mm. not a very good affair if he's claiming that he's yes. had them publicly. What's Does he his, have one wife? Or? What's his status? Yeah, we don't. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, also, this picture is this picture is quite. You know, th this is all right. But this is Albert. I don't know if you can see this. This is this okay. is Albert. Oh. <laughs> Uh, it's a very work. moody picture if from Albert. If you see this man out run. about, run away. <laughs> <laughs> he will want to have an affair with you, right? Sadly, we've run out of time, we, guys. Um, thank you so much for joining us there this morning. That's Ava Santina from Politics Show and the spectators of Freddie Gray. Thank you both. Well, you at home have been getting in touch with your views and opinions all morning. Where should we kick off with? Should we talk about Angela Rayner? That's been one of our top political stories we've been talking about all morning. Do you think that the interest into Angela Rayner's tax affairs is justified? Terry says, I remember the intense attack on the Tories during Partygate. It was Labour who fought for punishment for all liars and corrupt politicians. Now it's time they face the same... And thing. that's what I meant about double standards. Amber says every MP has to be investigated for taxes and corruption. It is in the public interest. Make the MPs treated the same as the public in the courts. Really interesting. Keep all of those coming in, please. Now, moving on, passengers on some of the country's busiest commuter rail routes await chaos today as train drivers go on strike as part of a long-running pay dispute. Well, our correspondent Nick Ellaby joins us now from Waterloo Station in central London. Nick, what impact is this having on commuters this morning? Yeah, good morning, Nicola. Morning, David. Huge impact on commuters. Today, day three of this round, latest round of strikes by drivers of the Aslef Union in England. Today, affecting commuters on busy routes in the southeast of England, south of England, East Anglia. Friday and Saturday, we had the north, the west country, and the Midlands affected. Uh, lots of people I've spoken to pretty cheesed off, but also quite a lot of support still for the train drivers. Lots of people going through tough times at the moment. And I think anyone seeing a group of workers asking for more pay, there is certainly a strong amount of support for the drivers. Uh, but huge effect to these busy commuter routes around London today and also into tomorrow with those overtime bans as well that are supposed to maximise disruption for the networks. I've been speaking to the commuters at Waterloo Station this morning, asking them, how long can you put up with these strikes for? Here's what they told me. I think loads of people are working at home now, so I think this could go on forever at the rate things are going. It's, yeah, they're getting how much a year? It's, it's very difficult to say how much more they could want, really. These train strikes for? Um, until the government pays them properly, basically. Are you, are you happy to support them for as long as it takes? I think so, because it's about safety and stuff and their work environment, so I think they've got to do what they need to do until they get noticed, you know? It obviously causes disruption trying to commute in today. I've got an important meeting to sort of run this afternoon, so, you know, it drives a bit of concern and obviously it drives you towards looking at kind of why they're, why they're striking, but times are hard for everyone, I think, aren't they? So, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's difficult. These train driver strikes have been going on for two years now. To find out more about what's happening and when they might be resolved, I've got the General Secretary of the Aslef Union, Mick Whelan. Morning, Mick. Thanks for joining us. First of all, you know, tr passengers on the rail network are down 30% since COVID. At this stage, these strikes are just hurting your industry, aren't they? Well, actually, the figures aren't quite that down, are they? We see that... Uh, 110% uh, of footfalls back at weekends and 90% during the week. We see the tube returning. We see revenue coming back. So, actually, there is a change. Uh, so, we do believe that there is an opportunity. But for us, the reality is that the people behind me, who don't want to be here losing money, haven't had a pay rise for five years. And all we expect, like every other worker in the country, is some dent in the cost of living. OK. And, you know, we, we're, we're told that the Aslef Union haven't spoken to any of the groups that could resolve this situation. So you've got the RDG, you've got the Rail Minister, you've got the Transport Secretary. It's over a year since you've spoken to these people. 
Who's, whose job is it to say, look, time to sit down and talk? Well, I believe it's the employers. We're not in dispute with the government. The government might be pulling the strings, but we've done 17 pay deals the last 12 months. Freight, Scotland, Wales, Open Access, Mersey Rail, Eurostar, Tube, Elizabeth Line. None of them made the demands that have been made here, which are irrational and unreasonable to give up all our terms and conditions for a massive pay cut. So it's not just about the money, is it? Can you explain a bit more about your sticking points? Our sticking points are they want to rip up every agreement we've ever made and got. Uh, to keep the privateers making their profits. Bear in mind, all the companies that we're talking about are actually making hundreds of millions of pounds in profits, declaring about the money that they're getting free from the government and paying dividends to, to their shareholders. Tell me then why the people who work for them shouldn't have a pay rise. So, Mick, you're sitting here with your arms folded, the government and the RDG as well doing the same thing. This isn't, this, how long can this go on for? Well, while the people behind me are returning mandates of 95 to 99 per cent in favour of strike action and action short of strike, we'll keep articulating their voice. They'll tell us when they've had enough. They'll tell us when they don't want to do any more. But they're in it for the long haul. Are we just waiting for the new government at this stage? Not really. I mean, I haven't discussed this with the Labour Party or anybody else. Our dispute is with the employers we currently work for. No matter who's in power, our dispute will still be with those employers. We'd hope there'd be more pressure to resolve it from a new government. But at this moment in time, we've got a government who doesn't care and it's openly doesn't like railways. OK, Mick, thanks very much. I mean, the government do say there is a credible offer on the table that hasn't been accepted. Uh, and the RDG say they are keeping channels of communication open. But at the moment, everybody's sitting around with their arms folded. And I expect more train strikes to come this year as well, guys. Thanks very much indeed, Nick. It's worth just pointing out this has gone on for two years. It's cost £2 billion to the taxpayer. That's Nick Ellerby there at Waterloo Station. Now, still to come on talk today, questions still remain over the death of paratrooper Daniel Berg, who went missing last August before his body was discovered in Ukraine a month later. Daniel's dad, Kevin, tells us about the tragic circumstances surrounding his son's death. Do you remember... Keep getting in touch with your views and opinions as always. This is Talk Today. It is 8.47. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position. But I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> <just> 40 <laughs> 40 minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. 
the UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was another era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. The time is 8.50. Now, a man is fighting for justice after his son was killed in Ukraine under suspicious circumstances. Kevin Burke's son, Daniel, was a British paratrooper and founder of the Dark Angels Volunteer Unit. He arrived in Ukraine in early 2022 to fight in the war against Russia. He was reported missing on the 16th of August, 2023. Kevin then flew out to Ukraine with the Sun's defence editor, Jerome Starkey, in September of that year. And Daniel's body was found exactly a month after he was reported missing on the 16th of September. Well, an inquest into Daniel's death was opened and the coroner ruled it unlikely that Daniel was killed in an act of war, rather an altercation or incident that led to him being shot by somebody travelling with him. Uh, well, now Kevin is looking for answers and he joins us now with the sons, Jerome Starkey. Welcome to both of you. Thank you so much for coming in Thank as well. Uh, we really do appreciate it. J just if we can start, Kevin, if you can just explain what Daniel was doing out in Ukraine, if you can start the story and, and tell us exactly uh, why he was there and what happened. Yeah, uh, basically it started with humanitarian aid from Poland into Ukraine at the beginning of the war. Um, and from that, FAST became um, a, a permanent venture into Ukraine. Um, and it was initially in a combat role, but realised that there was a, a, a lack of medical recovery mm -hmm. and he was combat medical trained. And so he started what was known as Dark Angels. Uh, the, the dark bit came from the fact it was a black vehicle that he used to rescue people. Um, and basically started doing frontline rescues um, and bringing people off and getting them into hospital and following it through. Mm. Um, and got quite a name for doing it I'm because sure. the commanders would phone up and ask for him to come to the front line. So he was 24 seven, um, but had difficulty maintaining staff so people would would leave but so uh, that was basically it right. and how did you find out initially um that he'd gone missing he went missing on the friday mm -hmm. and we got a phone call on the tuesday saying that he'd been registered as missing and that they were looking for him what we didn't realize was that the cover-up had already started he'd actually been killed on the friday and it was some four plus weeks before we realised what had happened. Um, as we realised that, <clears throat> the police held the suspects, which is, uh, his nickname's uh, Adam, but it's Abdel Fattah. They held him for 24 hours, and within that 24-hour period, he confessed to the shooting and described the shooting. And the description of the shooting that he gave on that day matches the autopsy report. Right. So the level of accuracy is quite high, but they let him go. On the Wednesday, they detained him again for 14 hours. But this time he was with his solicitors. Mm. And again, he confirmed that, um, you know, the involvement. And again, they let him go. And so he's now escaped. Um, we've just recently received credible, because it's been a long push and mm, a long sure. investigation. Of course. Um, we've received credible information uh, on who assisted him in his movement. Right. And so once we can close that side of things down, we, we can start to find out where he is. But basically, um, mm. if you don't mind, this is a bit of an appeal for, no, for, for information. Um, and Greater Manchester Police, who have been working with us and assigned um, a good team, a professional team, um, uh, have, have given us a number, so it, it's it's. It, it, I believe it might be showing on the screen, but it, it it's o one six one, which is Manchester, yeah. eight seven two five zero five zero, 
And if they just mention the case, uh, they're ready to transfer that Fantastic. to officers that will take details down. And obviously, drop the zero, plus four, four for anybody, particularly that's in Ukraine. Interesting. Um, and so, so you're, and thank, you're... Thank you for allowing that. No, no, absolute pleasure. And, and Jerome, you know each other well. You travel to Ukraine together. I think stories like this bring home, actually, the realities of war. When you're doing something out of the goodness of your heart, humanitarian aid, but you are in a war zone. And, and these kind of stories are, are horrendous. They're heartbreaking. You're absolutely right. So, I mean, Daniel had become a friend of mine. I'd met him uh, in the first year of the war, and I'd spent... I'd met him a, a number of times over the course of the following 12 months. And friendships are forged quite fast in the sort mm. of circumstances that we found ourselves in, which, you know, initially was living in a bunker, uh, getting shelled by Russian forces. And Daniel was one of those characters. Uh, he really stood through as somebody who was really trying to make a difference. There's a lot of people with a lot of talk, especially among the volunteer community. Daniel was the real deal. It's utterly tragic what happened mm. to him. And it's similarly tragic what, what Kevin and his family are now going through, not only the anguish of losing his son, of losing brothers, mm. uh, of losing a brother to, to um, Daniel's siblings, but also now Kevin's had to turn detective. And that's extraordinary. The work that yeah. Kevin has done to try and close mm. this case and bring Daniel's killer to justice I is extraordinary. We, I really wish we could talk to you for longer. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. Uh, thank you so yeah, much for coming in to tell your story. to you as okay, well. Okay, thank and, you for the time. I do hope you get closure. And we hope we can help in any way possible. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin Burke and Jerome Starkey are from The Sun there. Well, still to come, with a warning today that increases in rent will outstrip earnings, we'll be discussing if things are getting too tough for tenants. And do keep getting in touch, please, with all your views and opinions. This is Talk Today. The time is 8.56. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss you. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, did what fail her. Yeah, was to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
on TV, on radio, and on your smartphone. This is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with David Ball and Nicola Thorpe. Good morning, it's 9 o'clock on Monday the 8th of April. Yeah, we talk today on TV, radio, online and of course on your smart speaker. Your top stories this morning. Israeli troops are withdrawn from southern Gaza, raising fears over where they might target next. Angela Rayner's tax round deepens. Labour's deputy leader faces allegations she registered the wrong property as her main home. And rent increase outrage. The average cost of private leasing has risen by 18% since 2022. With warnings it could grow by another 30% over the next three years. And here we go again, another wet and windy day. In fact, a rather unsettled week. I'll have all the details in the forecast at the end of the programme. Here we go again indeed. Thanks very much indeed, Naz. But now it's time for your headlines with Emily. Thank you, David. Good morning. Israel has withdrawn almost all its troops from southern Gaza, leading to hopes that more humanitarian aid can safely reach civilians. Officials believe the IDF's reduced its number of troops in the region so they can regroup before targeting Rafah, where hundreds of thousands are sheltering. Well, yesterday, the British Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, said UK support for Israel is not unconditional after an Israeli attack on an aid convoy that left seven people dead. Well, the former chair of the Defence Select Committee, Tobias Elwood, has told Talk Today the situation is becoming even more complex. So the question is, if we actually did impose um, uh, some form of sanctions or freeze our arms sales, would we yield later a greater influence or not? And that is the concern we have separate as to whether international law has been breached or not. Very, very difficult questions requiring a lot of statecraft at this moment. A major manhunt continues after a 27-year-old mum was stabbed and killed while pushing her baby in a pram in Bradford. Police say Habiba Massam is wanted over the attack and that he's known to the victim, but they won't confirm how. They say he mustn't be approached. Chaos continues across the rail network this morning with train drivers walking off the job in their third day of major strike action over pay and working conditions. Staff at 16 train companies are taking part, causing cancellations, delays or no service at all to some areas. Stargazers here will get to enjoy part of North America's total solar eclipse tonight. If you live in the western parts of the UK, look up just before sunset. You could see a partial eclipse where the moon is covering a small portion of the sun. And move aside Jurassic Park, a US company believes it could bring prehistoric creatures back to life. Colossal Biosciences is working on reintroducing species like the mammoth and the dodo within four years' time. The firm's boss says they have all the technology they need and will use artificial intelligence to replicate their genes in their close living relatives. You're up to date with the headlines. I'll have another update at 10 o'clock. Have we learned nothing from that Hollywood? That is the craziest story I've heard. It's it amazing. Back, yeah, to Jurassic Park, finding the remnants in the amber. I don't, mas I don't mind so much with the dodo. T-Rex, nah, no, I'm have to that. stop at mammoths. Yeah. Absolutely. I was going to say, do you really want mammoths roaming the earth again? I'm not sure. Maybe oh, I do. Know. They're quite cuddly and cute, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they're cuddly. Well, no. well, thank you very much indeed, Emily. Thank you, Emily. Now, on to our top story today. Israel's defence minister says troops have been withdrawn from southern Gaza, raising fears that their next target could be Rafa. Well, the news comes as the Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, says that Britain's support for Israel is not unconditional following the killing of seven aid workers. Well, joining us now is Sun columnist Rod Little. Uh, Rod, really good to talk to you as ever. Um, this is moving very quickly, actually. It moved very fast over the weekend as well. We, we sort of have heard a change in tone from the government. Rishi Sunak saying the nation remains appalled. He talks about an immediate humanitarian pause and a long-term sustainable ceasefire. Cameron's words are really interesting, aren't they? Where he says that Britain's support and backing of Israel is not unconditional. That's a barbed warning. It is a barbed warning, and I think Israel has played its hand very badly recently. Um, it had an awful lot of goodwill from the West um, and beyond the West uh, on October the 7th, but that goodwill has, has I think, uh, gradually evaporated. Um, partly for reasons which are not the fault of Israel. I mean, 
Uh, if you accept that Israel has to uh, try to address the problem which it has, which is rooting out Hamas, then obviously people are going to be killed and some of those are going to be innocent people. Um, but it has it is perhaps stretched the patience of the West completely to the degree that for the first time in its existence, it could be in a position where it has where it's effectively isolated uh, all the, all the crises which israel has gone through in the last uh, 70 years uh, it has it has managed to have support at some point whether it be the soviet union for example uh, when when the state was set up whether it be uh, the western countries uh, and america particularly uh, during the uh, uh, 1967 conflict and also the yom kippur conflict and also the terrorism against uh, the Palestinian Liberation Organization during the 1980s. There was always British, American, European support for Israel. And <clears throat> that has gradually been winnowing away. And that is a very dangerous thing for Israel. It cannot exist isolated. How much do you think the hostages have been forgotten in all of this, Rod. Um, we saw protests at the weekend, families of hostages even laying the blame at Israel's feet, saying that actually if they'd acted sooner and agreed to one of these <coughs> hostage release deals, that the, the man that was found dead on Saturday might actually still be alive. I think it's... Uh... I think it's a salutary lesson that we all ought to remember, and particularly the Hamas groupies on the left in this country, who continue demanding a ceasefire and continue demanding from the river to the sea, or to remember that Hamas has still to give up many, many hostages, most of those hostages suffering indescribable torment uh, as, as the days go on. And that has been forgotten a little bit. And it is one of the justifications, of course, that Israel has for pushing forward. Hamas doesn't respond to niceness. It does respond to violence uh, because it's a terrorist organisation. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there is a problem that we, uh, particularly David Cameron, I, I mean, I think David Cameron's appointment as Foreign Secretary was probably the worst appointment of it, it even exceeds Liz Truss's appointment as prime minister uh, in its stupidity. I think he was a disastrous prime minister for foreign affairs uh, and, and will continue to be a disastrous foreign affairs uh, for foreign minister. So, uh, yeah, I think, I think that is a problem. We would all do well to remember that Hamas has nowhere near kept its side of the deal, but we are being told by the Egyptians that a deal is close to occurring, I believe. We are indeed those ceasefire talks, or indeed the, the deal is being thrashed out by the US, by the Qataris, by Egypt, by Israel and Hamas itself. One of the things that, a recurring thing we've talked about this morning is the fact that actually, and you said right at the beginning, Israel's made some terrible mistakes. The real fear yeah. is radicalization, that you're going to yeah. radicalize more young people. And I wonder what you made of this report. This was a poll by the Henry Jackson Society. I don't know if you saw it over the weekend. This is about, and pertaining to UK Muslims, only one in four British Muslims believe that Hamas committed murder and rape. 46%, nearly half of British Muslims, said they sympathise with Hamas. And these tend to be younger, well-educated kids, kids with degrees. That is a real problem. Alan Mendoza, the executive director of the Henry Jackson Society, said the findings show the failure of the UK's counter-extremism policy. Something is going deeply wrong. We don't have a counter-extremism policy. And anyone who's shocked by those uh, by those percentages <laughs> clearly doesn't know their country very well. Uh, I've been saying this for 20, 25 years, uh, that, that an awful lot of our Muslim population is simply not with us, is not on the same page as us culturally, politically, uh, uh, or in any way. Uh, because I notice as well, there's still the same amount of support for Sharia law. The same number of people wish to see the black flag of Islam or the green flag of Islam, whatever colour they have today, whatever day of the week it is, flying over the House of Commons. It is a huge, huge problem. And it's not helped by the morons who uh, infest uh, our counter-terrorism um, uh, uh, institutions, which <laughs> these days seem to buttress support for uh, groups like Hamas. And you may have seen uh, a few months ago uh, a bloke, uh, no, it's a woman, who joined one of the, uh, uh, the de-radicalising uh, uh, institutions 
and was 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 given a, a lecture where they were told that Hamas was probably right. <laughs> you know, if we are doing that, then what can you expect? Well, so, Rod, uh, you mentioned Sharia law <laughs> there. I mean, it's astounding that 32% of UK Muslims believe this country should ha have Sharia law. And of that group, half of them, nearly half of them, said Jews have too much power over government policy in this country. Doesn't this actually speak to, to that statement we've heard before? We have failed. Multiculturalism in this country has failed. We have to be bound by common values. Yes, of course. Multiculturalism is a terrible creed because... Uh, it, it, it means that the community becomes fissiprous, it, it, it falls apart, we don't share the same values as, as other people who we've uh, uh, invited into the country. So yes, it, it's, 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 it's a, the, the trouble is that the general public misunderstands the word multiculturalism and takes it as the same as multiracialism, and it's not, of course. Uh, multicultural, uh, multiculturalism eschews the idea that we should have a common purpose in our country, for example, but we should. At the same time, of course, there's an overwhelming majority of British Jews and British Muslims who are integrated, whatever that actually means, in British society. It's certainly not speaking for the majority of people. Oh, no, no, sorry, 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 hang on a minute. How can an overwhelming majority of British Muslims be integrated if 47% think that Hamas isn't a terrorist organisation? How, how can that be possible? You can't, that's the problem we have. The people say rubbish like that, and it is rubbish, I'm sorry, uh, at the same time as seeing figures which show that exactly the opposite is true. I understand that. My, no, my point being that people, you know, uh, to, to say that, to criticise Islam itself as a religion, as a, as a peaceful religion, I'm just saying that I wouldn't want to judge people simply because they're Muslim. I would absolutely judge somebody on whether or not they supported Hamas, but you can't simply say that because somebody's Muslim they believe X, Y and Z, just as I wouldn't say the same thing about Jewish people. That's the only point I was trying to make. But I want to move on to more domestic issues now, Rod. Angela Rayner, she is under fire again for what either did or didn't happen in terms of her second home. She denies any responsibility. The Tories aren't going to let this one go, though, are they, anytime soon, Rod? No, they're not. And um, I have to say that the, the, the actual uh, machinations of, uh, of, of what Angela Rayner did with her second home and where she claimed for and so on, I, I'm not convinced that that's the actual nub of the story. The real story for me about Angela Rayner is a very competent, very good politician. The real nub for me is the thing which is so typical of Labour Party politicians, which is they tell you to do one thing and then do something different themselves because uh, they can. Uh, and that was, you know, buying a council house, which she disagrees with, and selling it, which she disagrees with. She should not have done that. Uh, because she doesn't want anyone else to do it. And it ties in with people like, you know, uh, Baroness Chakrabarty sending her kids to uh, private schools when she doesn't want the population to send its children to private schools, say with Diane Abbott. Uh, and it, it's that which really rankles with the population, I think. I think you have hit the nail on the head there, Rod. And the fact is that Angela Rayner calling, saying I'm not going to disclose my tax details, whilst at the same time saying Act Shatta Murty had to disclose her. I mean, it's one yeah. rule for them and it's one, it's rule, one rule for, for the rest That's of us. Rod, uh, very erudite, as usual. Thank you very much indeed. That's Rod Little. Thanks a lot, from mate. Cheers. The Sun. Well, uh, still to come on the show, a warning today that increases in rent will outstrip earnings. We'll be discussing if things are getting too tough for tenants next. And do keep getting in touch with all your views and opinions, please. This is Talk Today. The time is 9.13. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong.
And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. The time is 9.17. Now, rent rates, uh, re uh, rent rates in the UK are set to rise by 13% over the next three years. Now, that's according to the Think Tank Resolution Foundation. Well, they say a bounce back from the coronavirus pandemic and wage growth both are contrib contributing sorry, to the increase. Well, joining us now is Connor O'Shea from Generation Rent. He says this will have a huge impact on renters. Well, meanwhile, Richard Blanco from the National Residential Landlords Association believes that the issue is a shortage of supply. Connor, let's start with you. Has the rate of inflation caused this hike in price? Uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, it's very nice to be here. Uh, unfortunately, the topic is not as positive as I'd like it to be. Rent increases are absolutely brutal for renters. Uh, yeah. We all know that. But I'm glad you mentioned the rate of inflation there because what we're mm. seeing is rent increases far outstripping inflation over the last couple of years. The Resolution Foundation reckons it's 13% over the next couple of years. But what we've seen is that it's 9% nationally, 10% mm. in London just over the last year gone, which is higher than the rate of inflation. And you can clearly see that renters are being squeezed. And it's a theme across the market at the moment that no matter what the circumstances are, it's the renters that fit the bill. And quite frankly, we haven't got any more space in our wage packets to continue this exponential I mean, growth. Th it's a really interesting point, actually, Richard, in terms of the renters are being squeezed, but the landlords are also being squeezed, aren't they? And that's the bit I don't... I think sometimes people always think landlords are terribly rich people. Actually, many people on middle incomes just happen... You know, they've put their money into a rental property, they're squeezed, their mortgages have maybe doubled, and, of course, somehow they're going to make ends meet. Yes, I mean, mortgages have quadrupled quadrupled in some cases, actually. Mm. Uh, and also what we're seeing is very punitive taxation, which means that some landlords are paying more tax than they're actually making in profit. So we're seeing 30% of landlords saying that they're thinking of selling in the next 12 months compared to only 10% who are thinking of buying. Do you want to just explain why the tax has changed? Because that's absolutely the nub of the problem, I think, which is that actually the tax regime has become quite draconian. 
It has, yes. What happens is um, you are uh, taxed on your overall turnover and then you get a tax credit back uh, for some of your uh, in mortgage interest costs. But so what happens is your tax is a much higher rate before you get the tax credit back. So it, it's very complicated. People don't understand it. Mm. And it, it's really unfair. It's the only business that's taxed on its turnover, actually. And not on profit. Yes, exactly, yes. Connor, what can we do to change that situation, particularly for younger people who, you know, they are not established enough to buy their own property, they're beholden to the rental market, and yet, you know, rents will soon be in some cases, above what people earn in a year. I'm pleased you said that, beholden to the rental market, because that's absolutely mm. where we are. Yeah. And that we can have conversations about landlords' position, and clearly they, they are a part mm. of this market. It's mm. a thing that, that happens. But renters are the people who live it day in, day out. And we have no choice. Lots of people are unable to buy their own home because property ownership is so inaccessible for so many. Mm. Mm. There's not enough social properties in this home. I think we'll all around this table mm. agree on that. Mm. And actually, we're in a position where renters must pay whatever the landlords suggest that they do. And while there are certain economic circumstances which have not benefited landlords in the last couple of years, we're also very much in a situation where the market is driving itself. The, the market is being pushed up by the notion that potentially the landlord might get more money if they kicked out their tenant or brought somebody else in, or that said tenant would have a rent increase thrown on them at the rates that we're talking about, 9 10 13%, so, which, so quite frankly, right. is not sustainable for the tenants who live in the home. No, you're right. And, of course, we're not building enough houses either. That's another thing. So the government said 300,000. Well, I think we built 140,000 of them. All the big political battles is now over the grey belt. Just going back to the landlords, though, the punitive tax regime has not helped this because those people, as I said, who are trying to make ends meet think, oh, I'm not doing this anymore, and they've actually got rid of the properties, taken them off the rental market, and that's why there aren't enough. Yes, I mean, we're seeing a huge shortage in supply. Um, the Labour Party say they'll build 1.5 million houses over the next parliament. That's the sort of thing we need to see. But, of course, that's going to be very tough to actually achieve. Mm. Um, and, you know, what's pushing up rents is the lack of supply, fundamentally. We also need to see more social housing as well to help people on lower incomes. Thank goodness local housing allowance rates have been realigned to the, the what's called the 30th percentile from this month, mm. which will, will help people on lower incomes. Mm. Richard, I totally agree with you, and there's lots that we do agree on, specifically relating to the local housing allowance. That's something that we, we totally uh, endorse. But I wouldn't necessarily say the tax rate is the nub of the problem here that you used, because there is a lot that goes on, which is the market feeding itself, driving itself. Uh, less than half of properties that are on the market in the UK for private rent have a mortgage attached to them, which yeah. means that while we talk about interest rates battering people and their mortgage rates going up, which is totally true in some cases, in more than half, it's not. And it's just the case of... There is the market that's growing. So, and so, it's a, again, every time that something happens, renters foot the bill. Uh, yes. And they're the people that are so, living so at the face of right. the fire. You here. are right in that. But what is happening is those small landlords are leaving, leaving the big landlords without the mortgages, and they're the ones that then control the market. And I think that's really a big problem in terms of making sure that you've got accessible housing that's cheap. And actually, I think there's a bigger problem here is what do young people think when they can't actually afford to get a foot on the ladder in the first place? Well, it's huge. And actually, the, the, the nub of this problem, to use your term, <laughs> in the broader sense, is that there is a huge redistribution of wealth from people who don't own assets yeah. and don't have things to those that do. That is what the market's doing at the moment. And we're looking here, I know we're talking about percentage of rent increases in the year. When we talk about the percentage of, wa of renters' wages that go on their rent, mm. it's absolutely huge. It's 30, 35, 40% in London. And you think about that's money that they can't spend on other things. That's money that we must give to our landlords. That's not good for the economy. And it's absolutely a redistributive thing of people without assets to people that do have assets, and we just think it's wrong. Well, let's remember that tenants tend to stay, on average, over four years, and landlords often don't increase rents whilst tenants are in the property. Uh, research we did a few years ago said that 64% of landlords didn't increase rents. Mm. They're having to now, unfortunately. I'm having to, uh, but by no means as much as I'm needing to uh, pay for my mortgages. So, you know, some of my mortgages are going up by £800, and I'm increasing the rent wow. by £100. So there are a lot of cases where landlords are being very sympathetic and really working quite closely mm. with tenants mm. to try and... Uh, uh, well, and housing's yeah. going to be a big issue as it comes to the next general election. Uh, let's hope so. It let's should be the front and centre yeah. of Not any political Not just party when agenda. an election is on the way. Thank you so much to both of you. Connor O'Shea from Generation Rent and Richard Blanco from the National Residential Landlords Association. Well, that's all from us here on Talk Today. We will see you tomorrow from 6 I don't think I'm here, but Kevin and Alex are up next. Uh, first of all, though, here's the weather with Naz. Don't go anywhere. This is Talk TV. <laughs>
Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello. We're still looking at rather unsettled conditions for today and, in fact, for this week. Today, it's uh, in the form of a name storm by Meteor France that is bringing wet weather across many northern or western parts of England and Wales. And later this afternoon and into tonight, there will be a bunch of showers moving northwards over central, southern and eastern areas. But for many parts of central northern Scotland, it will be mostly fine and bright. Northern Ireland, though, will see some rain through this afternoon. And overnight, the winds will strengthen down towards the southwest with gusts up to around 70 miles per hour. There is a warning from the Met Office for that. And the rain continues its journey further northwards up towards Scotland and northern England, where there is a warning for the south and east of Scotland, as there could be the risk of localised flooding from the rains there. Elsewhere, mostly dry and uh, clear with uh, rather cool conditions compared to the last few nights. But there will be lots of showers across the parts of the Midlands, central and eastern England that will continue there through tomorrow. The rain will also continue across much of Scotland, some of it turning wintry across the highlands. And the there will be rain across parts of Wales, easing later across southern areas in the south. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, right, oi, oi, treat girl. Having a conversation with a professional journalist, he chose to belittle her, diminish her, um, and use sexist language. I can't stand the word casual sexism. There's nothing casual about igniting and using kind of diminishing and belittling language about anyone, especially someone who's trying to do her job. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. And when the media constantly refer to trans criminals, when they are biological men as women, we will no longer put up with these lies about our gender anymore and about our sex. Trans woman is not a woman, a trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. I, that's robust. It's going to cause a, an argument. It's going to cause tension. But we've got to do it, because otherwise this country is going down the path. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying, um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. One parent commented on a review of Peppa Pig that their daughter had begun to lash out since watching the show and added that Peppa is rude, bossy, a liar, tattletale and even more. Say it's not so. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just happened. <laughs> Ooh, well, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it was nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, uh, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, you put him in an ice cream store. And once you get defeated by a guy named Begley, that's <laughs> it. You retire from politics, and you speak to Rosanna on primetime and have a lot more fun. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, 
If you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, had lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. They're now trying to 